Preface Is War Diminishing? A Study in the Prevalence of War in Europe from 1450 to the Present Day by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Bolzey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey Is War Diminishing? A Study in the Prevalence of War in Europe from 1450 to the Present Day by Frederick Adams Woods, M.D., Lecturer in Biology in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Author of Mental and Moral Hereditary and Royalty, The Influence of Monarchs, and Alexander Balzi, Adams Woods Fellow in Harvard University, 1913-1914. Copyright 1915 by Frederick Adams Woods. All rights reserved. Preface This volume represents... The completion of a collection of dates of war that I began in a more or less rough way some six years ago. Starting with the history of England, France, Spain and Russia, I was soon greatly struck by the failure of the modern centuries to give much diminution in the proportion of time devoted to the horrible art of war. As far as these nations were concerned, it seemed that there was no diminution of war worth speaking about. I was surprised to find that in the earlier, as in the latter periods, Man seemed to have fought about half of the time, and not, as is often erroneously said, almost continuously in the early stages of history. I did not believe that a natural and psychological phenomenon which had persisted so constantly could suddenly cease, and indeed, these states that I had collected influenced my whole attitude on the great questions of internationalism versus nationalism, and pacifism versus preparedness. Publication was delayed by other interests, but in October 1913, Mr. Bolsey, on his appointment as Adams Woods Fellow in the Department of Government in Harvard University, took over the material which I had collected, and, besides verifying or correcting the dates in a thorough way, was able to add material from the histories of a number of smaller nations in Europe. These smaller nations, and likewise Austria and Prussia, also showed a decline in the amount of war. Still, I am not certain that there is good proof that warfare has tended to disappear with the advance of the ages. Mr. Bolte's work was begun with no theory in mind, to quote his own words. Neither a romantic delight in war, nor holding a, a brief for the peace societies. It was something of a question in our own minds, and also in the minds of historians with whom we talked, whether one could always decide just whether a nation was at war or not, and just when a war began and when it ended. Mr. Bolsey used his own judgment as to what to include as technically a war. Other judgments would necessarily differ, but it is not likely that they would do so except to a minor extent, and they would certainly not affect the conclusions. As for the conclusions that are here drawn, I am myself largely responsible, as I am entirely for the introductory chapter. The dates of the wars, as they stand at present, are entirely the work of Mr. Bolsey, who is also responsible in part for the descriptive text. In counting up the years of war for each half-century, we have avoided the conclusion of difficulty of knowing just the month a war began or ended, by simply taking the first year and the last year as if they were always one half of a year. Also, all the wars that began and ended in the same year would on the average be about six months long, and have so been taken. It is hardly to be expected that these dates will forever stand without further correction, but until something better is brought out, it is believed that this publication, aside from its contribution to the science of quantitative historical interpretation, historiometry, will serve as a handy book for reference to historians. Frederick Adams Woods Brooklyn, Massachusetts, August 1915 End of preface. Authorities consulted. Statistics of the dates of war must needs be gathered in a great variety of works. Some of these are chronological, some are narrative. I will note these most often consulted in this research. The most useful encyclopedia guide in the domain of war in the ninth volume of our handbook Für hier und Flot by G. von Achten and H. von Albert, Berlin, Leipzig, Wien, and Stuttgart, 1912. It is part of a large work, still in process of completion, which aims to give, in dictionary form, 
an encyclopedia de Krieg Zwischenschaven. The ninth volume is, however, complete in itself and covers a field in considerable detail, especially for the things German. Its weakness appears to be a meagerness in the field of English history. The Cambridge of Modern History affords aid in this direction. Other general books have been useful, such as Richard Lang's Close of the Middle Ages, which is better for chronological detail, perhaps than for any other purpose. For the 19th century, nothing is more valuable than the epitome of universal history of Karl Ploetz, enlarged and corrected in the last American edition by William H. Tillinghast, Boston and New York, 1909. For the 18th century also, considerable reliance may be placed on Ploetz. For the Middle Ages and earlier modern period, except in German history, Ploetz is not reliable in any manner that demands accuracy. The annual register is valuable so far as it covers a field, that is, from the mid-18th century onward. No great difficulty exists, however, for the 18th and 19th centuries. Certainly may be approximated since 1700 in almost all cases. The greatest troubles are met with in the 15th century and those are merely succeeding, especially in Eastern Europe. For Austria-Hungary, the two special histories used were Alfonso, Huber, Geschichte Austerix, Gotha, 1885-1896, five volumes, a work which extends only as far as 1648, and Louis Leder, Histoire de l'Autorique, Hongri, du Pes les Sortines, Jusqua à l'Anne, H89, third edition, Paris, 1889. For Denmark, Carl Ferdinand Allen's Danish History and French Translation, Histoire de Denmark, Copenhagen, 1878, two volumes, and Nesbitt Bain's History of Denmark, Norway and Sweden, 1513-1900, to Cambridge, 1905. For England, Samuel Rawson Gardner's Students' History of England was arranged in capital style for chronological purposes. Little difficulty exists for France since the appearance of the admirable collaborative work, Edouard Ernest Lavie's Histoire de France, Paris, 1904. For Holland, Petrus Johannes Bloch's Geschen Dainins van het Nederlandsche Volk Goringen, 1892-1908, eight volumes, which appears in English translation by Oscar A. Beersad and Ruth Putnam, New York and London, 1898-1912, three volumes, is an excellent work. The figures for Prussia are not difficult to get, although Herbert Tuttle's History of Prussia, Boston, 1884, 1896, four volumes, is not an adequate work in every way. M. Waddington was able to carry his Histoire de Prus through the first volume only. Droysen's Geschichte des Prussischen Politik, Berlin, 1855-1886, five volumes, is one of the best authorities for this purpose. Great difficulties attended the completion for Russia, which Kamerson's Historia Gosudarstva Rossiskaro St. Petersburg, 1880-1889, 12 volumes in 6, is good as far as it goes, i.e. to 1613. Sergius Solvev's Historia Rossi, 19 volumes in 9, 1857-1869, is good for the rest of the 17th century and until 1732. Alfred Rembord's Histoire de la Russie, Paris, 1900, 5th edition, has many inaccuracies but is useful. No very admirable general history of Spain exists. The nearest approach, perhaps, is a rather ill-arranged work now in progress by Rafael Atamira, Y Criva, Histoire de España, Y de la Civilización Española, completed as far as the early 19th century in four volumes, Barcelona, 1900 to 1911. For Sweden, in addition to Bain's work, reference to Under Denmark are F. F. Carlson's History of Sweden, translated in German. Gotha, 1855, as Geschisch Schwedens, a continuation of Eric Gustav's Geiger's Svenska Volkshistoria. Stockholm, 1876, three volumes. Translated in English by J. H. Turner, London, 1845. No work referred to is more satisfactory in some ways than the recent Geschisch des Osmanischen Region, five volumes, Gotha. 1908-1913, of Professor Nicolae Joga 
of Bucharest. For chronological purposes, Jorge's work is somewhat difficult to use, but its thoroughness cannot be doubted. In connection with one of the many questions that come up as corollaries of this statistical report, a little book of charts by Otto Rembrandt, entitled Dizel in Krieg, may be mentioned. It shows in graphic form the relative sizes of the 19th century armies in European wars. A. Balzier End of Preface Section 1 of Is War Diminishing? by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Balzi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Hari. Chapter 1. Introductory. Within the last 20 years, hundreds and hundreds of books and pamphlets have been published on the subject of war and peace. But these have been almost without exception from the emotional, personal, and subjective point of view. It is strange that among the host of well-meaning pacifists and the phalanx of sturdy militarists, where the assumption is rife that war is to cease or ought to cease, no one apparently has taken the pains to find out if war really is ceasing. No one has made appeal to the simplest facts of history bearing on the philosophy of war, namely, the dates of wars. The definite actual years of peace and of war that have accompanied the lives of successive generations of men. Are the periods of war declining and the periods of peace increasing? Can we conclude from a broad survey of history that the forces of evolution have tended to make warfare of less and less importance as the centuries are rolled on? May we not raise the question, is not war likely to be more important rather than less as time goes on? War, like any natural phenomenon, has a space as well as a time element. Wars may be less frequently than formerly, yet they may be greater in magnitude, involving larger proportions of the total population. They may be more bitterly fought and subject to less interruption than in the olden times, and also the suffering may be greater even in spite of advancing knowledge and skill in the care of the wounded. The present war makes us quite willing to believe the most pessimistic assertions, whereas a few years ago a very large proportion of well-informed people would have scouted the idea that war was to be as important a factor in the future of man as it has been in the past. That is because the majority of people who study history do not learn anything from it. They read here and there as their fancy directs. They are as likely to have a false impression as a true one. The more they read, perhaps, the worse off they are, since they are sure to remember just that portion of history that will bend further their already warped judgment. Men who are effective as writers, speakers, or political leaders are bound to have their theories, prejudices, and convictions. Generally, the more powerful they are, the more hide-bound are their beliefs, and the more dogmatic their assertions. They may speak ex cathedra. The public does not wish for proofs. It merely wishes to hear, well expressed, those ideas that happen to be in vogue in its own sect, caste, nation, or party. All this is inevitable and natural, yet ought to be fully realised that these gifted guides of public opinion may do a great deal of harm. They do not seek the truth. They injure the progress of truth. They waste time in fruitless discussion. They distract the world's attention from the true and only fountain source of information, which is, and always must be, research. It was with wholesome disgust at the unscientific character of the publications of various peace societies that I began to collect these few humble facts. And why should there be several peace societies, one might ask? Is it to be such a thing as human rivalry even here? Perhaps the pacifists have been hard enough hit by the present manifestations of reality against theory. But when one re-reads the publications of some of these societies printed before the present war, and sees the way the persons who pride themselves on having the superior moral point of view openly disregard the truth. One is not very sympathetic if they suffer somewhat. Peace advocates start with the assumption that their convictions are the only true moral principles. They see a future civilization in which uniformity and helpfulness shall take the place of rivalry and brute force. 
The militarists reply, as a matter of fact, most military people do not reply at all because they are largely men who do things rather than men who discuss things. Militarist philosophers, we might say, of the Teutonic type reply that success in modern war is essentially intellectual, a matter of brain and eye, not of leg and biceps, of organization and leadership, of discipline, control and self-sacrifice. In a word, is a farthest removal from the brutal, in the sense of being animal or low, in the scale of organic evolution, a nation at war is the most highly complex organic aggregate that we know anything about. Man has arrived at control of nature because he is a fighting animal, and more than the other animals, he fought his way forward by reason of his brain. All the leading races of the world are descended from the conquerors of the world. The progressive whites of Western Europe and Northern America are essentially conquerors. The Japanese, the only progressive people in Asia, are essentially conquerors. The world's future progress will depend on what kind of people control its surface and dominate its activities. Here, then, is a true altar for the highest moral sacrifice, devotion to the great complex aggregate to which you, by nature, belong. Work and duty, with hope and indeed conviction, the your nation and race is to survive and play its part in the future. What larger ideal does man really know than this? What evidence has nature ever given that she wants all races to survive? Everything indicates that some races sink. Do you wish it to be yours? Do you wish to have your children subject to a race whose ideals seem repugnant compared to your own? Each according to his own, as he sees the right, must fight for the right as he sees it. There can be no higher glory. It is not with the wish to place the moral standard of the militarists above that of the pacifists I give their point of view. I do not even attempt to show that there is just as much to be said on this side as on the other. I do not pretend to know anything of moral questions, and am not much interested in them at present except to raise this protest. As a man of science, I should like meekly to ask these professors of ethics, law, and justice, these presidents of colleges, these moral educators, if morality is not necessarily bound up with truth. The pacifists have a right, I take it, to start with a subjective assumption based on their own inner feelings, but they certainly have no right to pervert the facts by ignoring or denying all unwelcome truths. The type of ideal of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace is shown in one of the publications of the American Association for International Conciliation, written by a prominent member of their executive committee, and also trustee of the Carnegie Endowment. The cynic smiles, as well he may. Human nature is not to be made over in a day, or in a year, or in a century. But the man who is clear sighted enough to perceive and to understand the everlasting force of a moral principle will not cease to work for its accomplishment, because the time of that accomplishment is in the far distance. Moreover, there are many things with the range of practical international politics that can be begun at once and done speedily. All this philosophy of civilization was presupposed by the trustees of the Carnegie Endowment when they began their work. They perceived that the minds of men must be convinced that morality is a higher principle than brute force, and that it must be proved to the satisfaction of public opinion, and the balance of individual, social, and political gain is on the side of peace and international friendship. In other words, no matter whether the balance of social and political gain is on the side of peace or on the side of successful war, we shall pretend that it is on the side of peace. The writer goes on in the following words. To accomplish these ends, elaborate and prolonged studies, highly scientific in character, must be made and their results published to the world. A little further down the page he says, it will not be long before the publication of the results of these scientific undertakings will begin, and it may safely be predicted not only that the volumes containing them will constitute an indispensable library for the pacifist, but also that they will contain material which, in the hands of skilled and experienced propagandists, can be made to count heavily in the enlightenment of public opinion elsewhere. Again, the cynic smiles, but this time at what constitutes in the minds of some people, a highly scientific method. But the cynic will certainly agree that it may be predicted that the volumes will be used by the propagandists. Such, then, is a frank confession 
of the way one prominent pacifist regards the problem. In another pamphlet called The Dawn of World Peace, William Howard Taft states, The battlefield as a place of settlement or disputes is gradually yielding to arbitral courts of justice. The interests of the great masses are not being sacrificed, as in former times, to the selfishness, ambitions, and aggrandizement of sovereigns, or to the intrigues of statesmen are willing to surrender their scepter of power. Religious wars, happily, are spectres of a medieval or ancient past, and the Christian Church is laboring in vainly to fulfill the destiny of peace on earth. Professor Edward L. Thorndike, writing from the psychologist's standpoint in 1911, and apparently influenced by an essay of William James's on the same subject, shows how deluded a man who usually bases his statements on quantitative research may become when he launches into the flowery domain of the philosophy of history. Professor Thorndike ignores the important fact that we cannot yet dogmatize as to the causes of war. He seems to assume that armed conflict arises from something in the minds of the common people, some natural longing for excitement and adventure that has to be satisfied somehow and might be vicariously satisfied in some other form of daring. He takes no cognizance of the uniform and willing peacefulness of men during periods of peace until they have been inspired to go forth to war. It would seem that in 1911, Professor Thorndike did not expect that there would be much more war. He writes as follows, We are all learning that a righteous cause is a cause for war, only when the wrong done by the war is less than the right it preserves. Nor will there be in the future any such readiness as there has been in the past to assume that the war which someone is interested in stirring up is really in the defense of national warfare. He takes no account of the actual grouping of mankind into more or less definite units until more or less centralized control from the top. Or if he does, he assumes that this in the future is to disappear. Whereas in fact, perhaps it is to increase. Who knows? The superficial and subjective interpretation of history, the complete misunderstanding as to war's causation, is well shown in pamphlet number 70 of the same International Conciliation Association. This was written in September 1913. As the author has expressed, most of the commonplace pacifist ideas, world as a unit, interdependence of the nations, delicacy of international credit, etc., a full quotation of the last paragraphs from this publication will serve as an expression of some of the theories of this sect. It must be conceded that the predictions have not been fulfilled. Within the unification of Germany and the freeing of the Balkan states, the centre of gravity of international politics shifted from Europe to the conflicting spheres of interest in Asia and Africa. A long period seems now about to ensue of adjustment of powers and influence accompanied by inevitable boundary and trade and colonial disputes. It will all be accomplished with a fraction of the bloodshed and labour that was wasted on the similar process in Europe. The Hague Court provides the machinery for the settling of the legal questions involved. The political questions will be settled by diplomatic negotiation and international conferences and commissions. Slowly we may expect, as an international public opinion is formed, to see a body of criminal international law developed, and the most crucial questions of international interest resolved by arbitration. Meanwhile, none of the media can be neglected. The peaceful settlement of international disputes, based on rivalries of prestige, must be the supreme aim of the peace movement. Such a peaceful settlement is being furthered by the recognition that is rapidly permeating the minds of the Western peoples that the world is a unit. The wits of diplomats are being sharpened by the discovery that war does not pay. International conference and negotiation has become an actual economic necessity. The enormous development of industrial technique during the last century, the utilization of natural resources, combined with the existence of a flood of capital ready to flow to any part of the earth that needs it in its economic development, have produced an economic interweaving and independence of the nations that is without parallel in history. Capital knows no country. By foreign investment, nations are knit together in bonds which defy all irrational prejudices and sudden or age-long jealousies. There is an international system of credit so delicate that a shock at any point means calamity to the entire fabric. 
The successful conquest of one nation by another would simply mean the destruction of the financial prosperity of the conqueror. Even the conquest of an undeveloped country like Tripoli hardly redounds to the prosperity of Italy, for the latter will depend upon a foreign capital for the development of the resources, and the riches of Tripoli will drain away to the profit of the financially capable nations. The idea is also seeping down through the racial consciousness of the Western peoples, that war is physically suicidal as well as economically unprofitable. War eliminates not the unfit, as its admirers so fondly claim, but the fittest and best. Europe is weaker, not stronger, for the men she has lost in war. This country is mentally and morally feebler for the slaughter of her finest manhood in the Civil War. The very perfection of armaments and the terrific drain of cost is already making war almost impossible. The nations are now on the verge of bankruptcy and actually do not dare to fight. These are the economic and psychological forces that are driving physical aggression and coercion from the field of international relations and bring diplomacy and arbitration to the front, not as supplements, but as actual substitutes for war. The various institutions which we have considered above are becoming the institutional expression of a world consciousness analogous to the consciousness of ethnic or national unity. A real feeling of internationality is being born. While we have been hoping, the nations have become linked in an interweaving of interests so powerful that the successful functioning of each part depends upon the prosperity of every other part. Worldwide arbitration or world federation will be but the recognition of the fact that war is world suicide. Nations will fight only when the world has lost all its hope and all its sanity. Another publication called The Phases of Progress Towards Peace by President S.C. Mitchell of the University of South Carolina dwells much on the optimistic side of the case. He writes as his selfish national interests hardly existed. The world has shrunk to the dimensions of a township all men are neighbours. This writer has a good deal to say about the value of neutralisation and agreements to delimit war. Thus Belgium is among the specially favoured nations. Just as the benefits of freedom presented in the Northwest are permanent contrast to slavery, so any sphere of civilization dedicated to peace will serve as a standing argument against the senselessness of seeking to determine questions of international justice by vast military establishments for organised murder. In fact, the neutralization of such countries as Belgium and Switzerland are a present application to war of the very principle of geographical delimination which prove effective in dealing with slavery. Delimitation of war by curtailing the category of questions which may give rise to war on the part of such signally conspicuous nations as England, France and America would amount to a demonstration of the effectiveness of reason of a brute force in the attainment of justice that must prove irresistible to mankind. All this written a few years ago reads sadly enough just how. Not only have we been told that in this commercial age the great banking interest controlled the question of peace and war, but we have been assured that the great force of international socialism would render impossible a worldwide conflict. The socialists claimed to total 10 or 12 million votes and 30 million or more adherents. Judging from their talk at international congresses, there seemed little likelihood that the great bodies of socialist workmen could be easily induced to take up war, but no people were quicker to fly to arms than these same socialists. Their protest was practically nil. Instead of holding together in united brotherhood, each faction is now calling the other traitor. The socialists, like the pacifists, were a complete misunderstanding as to the psychology of war and the position of war as a phenomenon in human evolution. They completely misjudged the primordial instincts and falsely prophesied through lack of fundamental knowledge, either biological or historical. The activities of the militarists a few years ago in England and in France are now gratefully accepted by all classes. It is not probable that many are wishing that they have been less well prepared. Discussion has given place to action. There is no time at present for anything else, but after this war is over, or seemingly over, there will be a great deal of discussion about the question of permanent peace. When that time arrives, it is to be hoped that the present catechism 
will have shown the theorists how tremendously complicated the problem is, and that they will treat the question with more humble regard. The criticisms that I have brought forward have been made not with the idea of useless ridicule, but to illustrate the complexity of the problem and the need of, of honest systematic research. Much that is one-sided might also be found in writings of the extreme militarists. There is one idea in particular, often quoted either by them or brought up against them, that is now in poor repute. That is the contention of armies preserve the peace, or are for the purpose of preserving the peace. The advocates of universal peace naturally say, the present war has absolutely disproved the contention that strong militarism will preserve the peace. The militarists ought never to have said that an army was to preserve the peace. If they had spoken frankly, they would have said that the function of an army is to win in war. This idea during times of peace being repugnant to the popular mind, it has always been thought the proper thing for each nation to speak of its own army as an army of defence. Since at any time in history other nations are growing and gaining in strength and others are becoming less strong, it is impossible that all armies should be armies in defence. All armies that are relatively growing are potentially, presumably, armies of conquest. When the trial comes, they may or may not meet the test, since wars usually cannot come out exactly even. Either these armies of potential conquest become armies of real conquest, or else if they are beaten, some other army is proved to have been indeed an army of potential conquest. One does not need to multiply instances to show how confused and gratuitous are most of the utterances upon the philosophy of war. If one were studying the philosophy of vice, it would not be thought unfitting to admit that the problem was a hard one, that human frailty and passion had existed since time immemorial, that human nature had changed but little if at all, that a phenomenon that had been in existence for thousands of years would probably show itself to some extent one hundred or two hundred years hence. What, then, is the reason that well-meaning and intelligent people are not prepared to take the same attitude about war, or to accept the view that war is likely to exist in some form and to some extent one or two hundred years hence? Probably the difference lies in this. One is a constant phenomenon, while the other is intermittent. Vice is to some extent always present, and is constantly brought to our attention by the daily press. War, on the other hand, occurs with long interruptions, so that whole generations of men may live and die without ever experiencing it. Furthermore, all emotional and bodily feelings, passions, and instinctive responses are very difficult to conjure up when they are not actually felt. Just think, even, how difficult it is in the cold of winter to conceive that we shall ever again suffer from extreme heat, or vice versa. On a frightfully hot day in summer to imagine Arctic cold. Under ordinary conditions, it is questionable if any one can imagine the agonies of thirst suffered by a man lost in the desert. A nation at war is in a different instinctive and emotional state from a nation at peace. It has responded to instincts not called forth in times of peace. Tribal and gregarious instincts always potentially present in all groups of men, but lie in dormant until required. The war instinct is probably a different thing from the fighting instinct. These instincts may have a relative beginning far back in early organic evolution, but they now seem distinct, both in their origin and their utility. The fighting instinct in the true sense of the word is not useful, in fact, it would go very badly with a man who had the fighting instinct. If a man goes around fighting everybody, he does not last long. In the far west, just before the vigilante days, there were just one moment, so to speak, in the world's history when the real fighting man prospered. Some of those early desperados, like Boone, Helm, and Henry Plummer, lasted a long time. They killed many a good man but sooner or later the vigilantes got them all. The law-abiding element grew, and the outlaw element declined, and soon the early days in the far west became a closed chapter, and a chapter that we can now say was unique. I think it is safe to say that there never was before in the whole written history of the world any time like that in the early west, when a man could walk about killing people and keep it up. 
such a social order, or rather disorder, shows us by its own qualities how wonderfully free from fighting and killing ordinary daily human intercourse is. Let us picture to our minds the life of the early cities of antiquity, Thebes, Babylon, and Tyre, and the smaller communities as well. We can conceive of these people quarrelling much, but not of a man single-handed holding up the town. Nor can we suppose that there was much killing within any one town or city, not indiscriminate killing outright, but left by individuals, and the organised killing by groups and factions. The most primitive and savage society shows the same thing. There is much killing of one tribe by its neighbour tribe, but a man who killed within his own tribe would certainly become unpopular. In days of old, in sparsely settled regions, the highwayman flourished, but that is exactly my point. There is a group formation of men that necessitates the life of peaceful citizenship. The natures that have not been willing to adapt themselves to the environment of groups have been weeded out. The quarrelsome types have tended to disappear. Throughout all the ages, and for about half the time, groups have fought against other groups. That is the reason why the war instinct, in contradiction to the fighting instinct, has taken a different course. There has been little of any natural selection tending to eliminate the war instinct. It has been useful for obvious reasons. No natural groups of men could have been evolved without the gregarious warring instinct, since the groups that were relatively deficient in the qualities that hold men together would be just the ones that would as a group crumble away. Hence some groups must from time to time be growing and strengthening themselves at the expense of others. Some survived groups are always present, and may be regarded as living entities endeavouring to preserve their form. They are to a certain extent natural, to a certain extent artificial. That is to say, they in part depend on racial similarities, but also to a great extent on political accidents changing with the off-shifting outline of the political frontiers. These groups should never be thought of as absolutely definite entities with clearly cut out lines. Not like animal species, but rather should be thought of as varieties and sub-varieties with vague geographical boundaries and more or less of a tendency to hold together as a unit. They are much more liable than our animal varieties to sudden splittings and rearrangements, so that the history of European warfare presents, in the ever-changing alliances, a kaleidoscopic picture. The natural enemies of any group are its nearest surrounding groups, but some of these may be, for the time being, its friends and allies. It all depends on the exigencies of the political situation. The result of it all is that today, or at any day up to the present, practically every young or middle-aged man is ready to respond to the call for arms when the gregarious fighting instinct is stimulated. It is essentially a gregarious instinct, therefore, only, after many persons are already affected, is its full force felt. That is also why, in the initiative stages of the ebullition, the action of a comparatively small number of persons counts for so much, if they in any way exercise a practical control or leadership. The instinct is there simply because it is an instinct, and therefore, like all instincts inherited in the germplasm of the race. It matters not whether a man's immediate ancestors did or did not actually take part in warfare. The reason why it makes no difference is because acquired traits are not inherited. That is, if they are acquired from the environment, acquired from educational practice. Biologists are in almost universal accord on this point. Therefore, as is often the case in the history of man, one whole generation of a race lives through maturity and dies never experiencing war, but the war instinct is not the least lessened thereby. If these human problems are to be treated scientifically, they must be tested in the objective spirit of inquiry. The first need in science, at least in inductive sense, is to collect the facts. We must first collect all possible facts about war. Next, we must analyse and classify these facts. This will lead to some understanding as to a. causes of war, b. results of war. Among the causes of war, we may provisionally postulate racial, economic, religious, and personal causes. Among the results, we must try to weigh not only the evils, but also the possible benefits. 
the intellectual and moral as well as the political and economic effects the aftermaths of war and their relations to industrial commercial literary and artistic activity in weighing all these results of war distinctions must be made between successful and unsuccessful war for it is highly improbable that the effects can be the same on the nations that win as on the nations that lose then again the interests of certain portions of the nation are not identical with the interests of the nation as a whole for instance a successful war waged in a foreign country may not benefit the rank and file among the conquerors but the officers and the families of the officers and the governing classes in general may as a class profit much in the extension of wealth and power another obscure question one that has been much discussed and but little studied is the relationship of war to eugenics what is the selective survival of war as influence on the race and on the evolution of mankind this selection must have its good side as well as its bad the evils are obvious and have been much exploited the removal by war of the strongest and the leaving at home of the weakest to propagate the race is bound to have as a result a physical deterioration of the population concerned on the other hand critics have contended that the great mortality of war is really an advantage to the race because within the army itself those who can survive hardship and disease must be by nature stronger than those who succumb also in modern warfare cunning and resourcefulness count for a great deal it seems highly probable that more than ever before superiority in intelligence is a great asset among fighting men the way this works out in relation to survival of the fittest is curiously interesting it must be admitted that among all the millions who today are firing at each other either shells or bullets the men who are the most accurate with gun or rifle are other things equal doing the most killing other things are of course not equal success depends on various factors amount of ammunition rapidity of transport good leadership etc etc but the fact remains that in spite of it all the best shots are killing more people than the poor shots have then it follows that the best shots are themselves less often killed than are the poor shots after any interval of time to make this clear it is perhaps necessary to imagine an extreme instance suppose two trenches contain 100 men each let one trench be supposed to be filled with extraordinarily good shots the other with extremely poor ones then after an interval of time nearly all the men in the trench of poor shots would have been hit while only a very few among the good shots would have been hit the same principle holds no matter how the men are distributed and the best shots will be themselves less often struck it has not occurred to the individual soldier to think of his chances of survival through the war being enhanced by the fact that he is a good shot that is because so many other factors enter in that mean more to him personally it makes a great difference to his chances personally where he happens to be sent he may very likely be killed by shrapnel or by a bayonet but on the average for all the soldiers on both sides this fact accounts toward the selection for survival of a certain kind of superiority it is highly improbable that superiority in handling modern weapons is not correlated with general mental superiority so it is with other forms of killing if it be admitted that intelligence is a factor at all then the more intelligent must themselves tend to escape from the mere fact that they tend to do more of the killing if strength and intelligence are of any value in a bayonet charge then just so far as they tend to do the killing of opponents so they must tend to the survival of their possessors with artillery indirect fire telephones wireless and modern machine guns intelligence must count for a good deal in the successful destruction of the enemy then it counts that much toward the survival of those who do the destroying another matter that is very often mentioned is a percentage of officers to men among the killed and wounded returns usually show a regrettable disproportion of officers among the casualties this is said to lower the average quality of the blood of the nation it does of course lower the average but it must be remembered that as a question purely of the evolution of man man has not evolved essentially by a raising of the average it is a rise in the intelligence of a very small percentage of all mankind that has been the feature in the growth of civilization 
it has always been the same in all organic evolution. The world today is farther advanced in evolution than it was in the Carboniferous Age, not because the average of all types of life is higher, but because some of the types are higher. Some may have sunk even lower in the scale of life. It is the same in the evolution of the mammals, and the appearance of man among the mammals. Great things have happened, not because all the mammals progressed, but because one out of a very great number progressed. If the officers constitute 1%, and the soldiers 99%, the officers might be reduced to three quarters of 1%. There would be loss in the average of the whole, but the three quarters that remained among the officers might by selection be superior on the average to the 1% there at the start. In whatever light we may view all these difficult questions, the great fact remains that somehow man has evolved, and he has fought, presumably, half of the time. If warfare is so deleterious, it may be asked, how did we get where it is? We have thus seen how difficult the complication is the philosophy of war, yet most writers have been content to take one side or the other of the issue, so that we have scarcely begun to have a science on the subject. With the hope that some day this tremendously important problem may be better understood, let us examine and discuss a few primary facts. End of section 1「of Is War Diminishing」by Frederick Ames Woods and Alexander Bolsey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2 Is War Diminishing? Let us turn at once to the most generalized of our results. The grand averages, as they are tabulated on chart D, by half-century periods from A.D. 1450 to the present day. The impression is, in a moment, obtained that certainly there is a falling off in war. The lines slope downward like the sides of a great mountain chain. It is not a continuous fall, but the lines on the right are on a noticeably lower level than on the left. These lines mark off the percentages of war years by periods of 50 years each. Following the central line, or average, of the other two, we see it rising from 1450 to 1600, when it starts down very rapidly to 1750 to 1800, and rising again for 1800 to 1850. From 55%, the grand average rises to 71%, falls to 28%, rises to 35%, and falls to 22% the last half-century being the lowest of all. If this chart were for the entire history of Europe, from the earliest records to the present day, it would be very satisfactory and conclusive. It would then seem that the time to vote to organise warfare had risen with the development of large national units and declined with the advance of civilization. If our great peak were, say, the 5th century, and our lesser peak to the right were the period of the Reformation, then again it would be very significant. But the chart, as it actually stands, does not do more than throw a moderate amount of probability in favour of declining war years. That is because its range of time is not long enough. We would like very much to see the percentages for the centuries prior to the 15th. If these should be found to be as high as, or higher than the period 1450 to 1700, it would be indicative that the drop from 1700 to 1900 presaged a new moment in humanity's evolution and not a minor wave in the long roll of the ages. European war years have been diminishing for two centuries, but it must be remembered that while 200 years seem a long time, 200 years are, as a moment, in the hundreds of thousands of years that mankind has been on this planet. Even if man had existed only 100,000 years, which is a low estimate, if the whole chart is a foot wide, then two centuries make the space between one thirty-second and one sixty-fourth of an inch, and it is with the psychology of war, human instincts, and elemental passions that our problem is bound up. If a year of research will enable one to examine about one thirty-second of an inch of the curve of war, or about one-fifth of one percent of one particular side of the whole problem, how much chance have the superficial philosophers of war, who are so freely expressing themselves, 
of doing anything more than satisfying their own subject emotions, of making a little money, and getting their pictures in the newspapers. Some say that since the inductive method has only given one thirty-second of one inch of a foot, the deductive method is the only one that has any chance. But my reply is that the arguers have not got anywhere. That the little portion of the curve that I have examined is found declining, and furthermore, I should hope that someone will work in the other regions of history and report on other dates. This curve on chart D may be looked at from another point of view, which shows that it is probable that war years are declining, but not at all certain. If we divide the whole line into parts of about the same length as the small rising line, 1750 to 1850, we then get approximately eight parts, three of which are ascending, positive, and five of which are descending, negative. These are the order from left to right. Positive, positive, negative, 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 positive, negative. Anybody knows that a coin might fall head, head, tail, 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 head, tail, without awakening curiosity or comment. But ours is not as meaningless a case as that. Our figures do have some significance, since the pluses are more to the left, and the minuses are more to the right. Also, the minuses exceed the pluses 5 to 3. Next question is, what types of nations has this decline been the greatest? On chart D, the five strong powers, England, France, Prussia, Russia and Austria, are separated from the five lesser powers, Turkey, Spain, Holland, Denmark and Sweden. There it can be seen that it is the stronger nations since 1700 that have devoted the most time to war. Moreover, the lesser nations were once the great powers, Spain, Turkey, Holland and Sweden were active in warfare at the same period that they were politically great. A study of chart B does not make one feel that the vigorous countries have noticeably renounced trial by force. The lines for England, France and Russia would never suggest that militarism is ceasing. All show blunt fluctuations but no tendency in one direction more than another. Austria gives a striking decline but Austria is certainly not today in the same position of importance relatively to other nations that she was in the 16th century, where we find her fighting 80% of the time. Prussia alone, among the expanding nationalities, exhibits a decline in war years. Yet it cannot be readily believed that modern Prussia has set a shining example of Pacific policy. Her methods have been aggressive, her war swift and important. The time element is not the only aspect of the philosophy of war, although in this research it is our chief concern. So much then for the broader conclusions warranted by our dates of war and peace. It seems worthwhile also to analyse the history of each country by itself, to comment on special characteristics and to indicate some special directions that would seem to repay for the research. Especially interesting is the relationship between war and national progress, territorial and other materialistic progress, gains and losses on the economic balance sheet, religious and intellectual awakenings, artistic and literary revivals, all which doubtless have some correlation with war, either negative or positive. It remains for the future to disclose these grand interactions. We can at present do little more than mention a few salient facts as they seem to relate to the causes and effects of warfare. End of section 2 Section 3 of Is War Diminishing by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Balzi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3 Austria and the Habsburgs. Austria's career as a fighting power reached its apogee in the West in the Thirty Years' War, 1618 48. Since then, a steady decline in the amount of war has gone on, and this, despite the participation of the monarchy in practically every great European struggle until the middle of the last century. The first two centuries after 1450 were filled with an enormous number of wars in the Austrian dominions, especially in her eastern provinces, where Hungarian and Turk were almost equally her foes. 
Those were the days of the Haniadi in Hungary, men whose scabbards were rusted, but their swords never. Matthias Corvin Haniadi followed his father, John, and in turn was succeeded by the two Sapodias, who ruled part of Hungary during most of the 16th century. The Huniadi fought with the emperor frequently. The Zaporias even leagued themselves with the Turk against him. A triangular struggle thus developed, which was carried on by other Hungarian and Transylvanian chieftains, the Bathories and Rakozisks in Transylvania, and the Bethlen Gabor and the Torklis in Hungary proper. Such were the relations of Austria, Hungary, and Turkey until the Peace of Passarowitz in 1718. In Bohemia, Austria had another annoying problem. In 1450, Bohemia had just emerged from the Hussite Wars. George Poor de Bred stirred with the embers up again, engaged in war with Matthias Corvin Haniadi, as well as with the Emperor. And after his death in 1471, the same state of affairs went on until the crushing blow of the White Mountain in 1620 ended Bohemia's separate existence. The figures below show the total number of years in which Austria was engaged in war, divided into fifty and hundred year periods, beginning in 1450 and ending in the year 1900. A timeline is displayed on the page. From 1600 to 1650, there were 40.5 years of warfare, or 81%. The fall from that time to 1900 can be seen to be very rapid and continuous. It is a remarkable decline and is paralleled only by Prussia. Austria, 1450 to 1419. Regency, 1439 to 1457. 1446 to 1453, the emperor odds with the nobility of Hungary and Bohemia. 1454 to 1456, raid of Mohammed II of Turkey, hostilities ended without treaty. Ferry III and Albert, 1457 to 1463. 1461 to 1463, the emperor at war with other Habsburgs in Austria. 1462, Matthias Corvin Honiadi. 1462, Bodhi Brad of Bohemia at war with North German states. Frederick III, 1463 to 1493. 1463 to 1464, Hunyadi at war with the Sultan of Turkey. 1468, Frederick III's invasion of rebellious Bohemia. 1468 to 1469, Hunyadi of Hungary, Catholic champion against Podibrad of Bohemia. 1469 to 1480, Turkey. 1470, Bohemia war with Hungary again. 1471 to 1478, Continuation of semi hasidic war between Bohemia and Hungary. 1477 to 1478, Emperor of War with Hungary. 1478, Baron Krieg in Carinthia. 1480 to 1491, Emperor against Hungary, ended by Peace of Pressburg. 1482 to 1483, Hungarian aggressions against the Turks. 1490 to 1495, Hungary at war with Turkey. Maximilian I, 1493 to 1519. 1495, France, League against Charles VIII. 1496 to 1497, France. 1499, Swiss Confederation ended by Peace of Basel. 1499 to 1502, League with Venice and Pope against Turkey. 1508 to 1513, Venice, League of Cambrai. 1512 to 1519, Turkey, ended by three years' truce. 1512 to 1514, France, Emperor League with Pope and Holy League. 1513 to 1518, Venice, ended by a truce. 1514, Bowen and Krieg in Hungary. 1515, Bowen and Krieg in Austria. Charles V, 1519 to 1521. Ferdinand I, 1521 to 1564. 1521-1533, Turkey and Sapodia of Hungary. 1521-1526, France ended by Treaty of Madrid. 1522-1523, Knights War, Rebellion of Sikingen, etc. 1524-1526, Born Krieg in Sachsen, etc. 1526-1529, France ended by Peace of Cambrai. 1532-1534, Turkey and Sapodia of Hungary. 
War in Wittenberg against Philip of Hesse, etc. 1535. Charles V's expedition against Tunis. 1536-1538. to 1538, France ended by Treaty of Nice. 1537-1540. Revolt of Ghent. 1537-1538. Sepoya of Hungary. Ended by Peace of Grosswardian. 1537-1547. Turkey ended by a five years' truce. 1541. Charles V's unsuccessful expedition against Algiers. 1542 to 1544. France ended by Peace of Crebi. 1546 to 1547. Schmalkaldic League. Battle of Marburg. 1551 to 1562. Turkey ended by a seven years' truce. 1552. War with Maurice of Session. Ended by Convention of Passau. 1552 to 1556. France. Ended by Truce of Vaucelles. Maximilian II, 1564 to 1576. 1565 to 1568. Turkey, ended by Peace of which was renewed. Rudolf II, 1576 to 1612. 1575 to 1593. Partisan War in Hungary against the Turks. 1587 to 1588. Poland in support of Maximilian's claim to throne. 1593 to 1606. Turkey, aided by peace to Zitva Mandan. Matthias, 1612-1619. 1611-1612, Bathory of Transylvania. 1614-1615, Berlin, Gabor, Hungary. 1615-1618, Venice, aided by peace of Madrid. Ferdinand II, 1619-1637. Ferdinand III, 1637-1657. 1618-1648. Thirty Years' War, ended by Peace of Westphalia. Leopold I, 1657-1705. 1657-1662, Rakozi of Hungary, at war with Poland and Turkey. 1657-1660, the Emperor, ally of Poland, at war with Sweden and allies. 1661-1664, Turkey, ended by 20 years' truce of Temeswar. 1670-1671, rebellion against Habsburgs in Hungary, led by Torquay. 1673-1679, France, and by peace of Nicht-Wiedenden. 1675-1679, Sweden. 1676-1687, Hungarian rebellion led by Emric Tokeli. 1680, rebellion of Bohemian peasantry. 1682-1699, Turkey, and by peace of Karlowitz. 1688-1697, France, and by peace of Ryswick. Joseph I. 1705 to 1711. 1701 to 1714. France in a way peace of Rastalt. 1701 to 1711. Revolt of Francis Rakoczy II. Ended by Treaty of Sultmar. Charles VI. 1711 to 1740. 1716 to 1718. Turkey in a way peace of Peserowitz. 1718 to 1720. Spain. War of Quadruple Alliance. 1733 to 1735, France and Poland, War of Polish Succession. 1737 to 1739, Turkey, ended by Peace of Belgrade. Maria Theresa, 1740 to 1780. 1740 to 1748, France, ended by Peace of Oxa Capel. 1740 to 1742, Prussia, ended by Peace of Breslau, First Silesian War. 1744 to 1745, Prussia ended by Peace of Dresden, Second Silesian War. 1756-1763, Prussia ended by Peace of Herbertsburg, Third Silesian War. 1778-1779, Prussia ended by Peace of Teschen, mediated by Russia. Joseph II, 1780-1790, 1787-1791, Turkey ended by Peace of Sistova, 1787-1790, Revolt of Belgian provinces, especially in Brabant. Leopold II, 1790-1792. Francis II, 1792-1835. 1792-1835. Louis Napoleon, 1797. France ended by peace of Campo Fornio. First coalition. 1798-1801. France ended by peace of Luneville. Second coalition. 1805. France ended by peace of Pressburg. Third coalition. 1809, France aided by Treaty of Schoenbrunn.
1809, Russia. 1812 to 1813, Russia. 1813 to 1814, France and by first treaty of Paris. 1815, France, Les Saint-Jours. 1815, Naples and by flight of Morat. 1821, intervention of Naples and Sardinia. 1831 to 1832, risings in Modena, Parma and the Romagna. Ferdinand I, 1835 to 1848. 1840, intervention in Egyptian in Broglio. 1846, risings in Galicia and Krakow, put down by the powers. 1848, second Vienna insurrection, in way capture of Vienna by Windischgratz. Francis Joseph, 1848. 1848 to 1849, Sardinia, campaign of Novara. 1848-1849, Hungarian insurrection, put down by Russians at Villagos. 1848, Denmark, Austria took part as member of Germanic Confederation. 1859, France and Sardinia, ended by Peace of Zurich. 1864, Denmark, Austria and the Ally of Prussia, Peace of Vienna. 1866, Prussia, ended by Peace of Prague, the Seven Weeks War. 1869-1870, Rising in Dalmatia. 1878-1879, Occupation of Bosnia and the Herzegovina. 1881-1882, Risings in the Herzegovina, Bosnia and Southern Dalmatia. 1897-1898, Intervention in Crete. 1914, Serbia, Russia, France, England, Belgium, Japan, Italy. End of section 3. Section 4 of His War Diminishing by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Balzi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4. Denmark. Denmark is the only country that never gives as much as 50% of war years during any half century. It has been the most peaceful of all nations, hence we have the suggestion that a more profound study that is usually accorded to the history of Denmark would be well worth while. The figures in half centuries show a fair improvement with the course of time. Below are seen the years of war in each half century and in each century. A timeline is displayed on the page. Denmark was once a great and powerful nation, but it was back in the 14th century in the days of Voldemar III, and the great Queen Margaret, anterior to the commencement of our own dates. Subsequent to 1450, Denmark has never been more than a small and unimportant unit from a geographical or political point of view. There has existed, for most of the time, a good share of general prosperity in Denmark, a good average intelligence, and a widely diffused wealth among the middle classes, not much poverty and not many very rich people. Denmark's history presents many long periods of peace, there was one such of 52 years in the 17th century from 1720 to 1772. Denmark, 1450 to 1914. Christian I, 1448 to 1481. 1451 to 1457. War in Scania against Karl Knudsen. 1459 to 1460. Raids in Holstein. 1463. Expedition against Russia. 1463 to 1465. Sweden, in Scania. 1467 to 1471, war in Scania against Swedes. John, 1481 to 1513. 1495 to 1497, war for the Swedish crown. 1500, war in Dirtmarsh. 1501 to 1513, Sweden. 1502 to 1506, Norway, the ally of Sweden. 1508 to 1512, Norway. 1512, Lübeck and the Hansa. Christian II, 1513 to 1523. 1516 to 1520, Sweden, conquers the Swedes by Danes. 1521 to 1524, Swedes revolt against Danes under Gustavus Vasa. Frederick I, 1523 to 1533. 
Interregnum, 1533 to 1534. 1534, Revolt in Jutland. Christian III. 1534 to 1559. 1535 to 1536, War of Fiona and with Lubeck. Frederick II, 1559 to 1588. 1559, Conquest of Dirtmarsh. 1561 to 1570, Russia, First Great Northern War. 1563 to 1570, Sweden, First Great Northern War. Regency, 1588 to 1596. Christian IV, 1596 to 1648. 1600 to 1611, Sweden, War of Kalmar. 1616 to 1618, Sweden, War of Kalmar. 1620 to 1622, Sweden, War of Kalmar. 1625 to 1626, Sweden, War of Kalmar. 1625 to 1629, Empire, Thirty Years' War, ended by Peace of Lübeck. 1626 to 1628, Sweden, War of Kalmar. 1628 to 1629, Sweden, end of War of Kalmar by Truce of Altmark. 1630, Hamburg. 1638, destruction of Polish fleet near Danzig. 1643, Hamburg. 1643 to 1645, Sweden. Frederick III, 1648 to 1670. 1657 to 1658, Sweden, ended by the Treaty of Roskilde. 1658 to 1660, Sweden, ended by Peace of Copenhagen. 1666 to 1667, England, ended by Treaty of Breda. Christian V, 1670 to 1699. 1675 to 1679, Sweden and France, ended by Treaties of London, Fortainebleau. 1676 to 1679, Hamburg. 1686, Hamburg. Frederick IV, 1699 to 1730. 1699 to 1700, Sweden, ended by Treaty of Trevendal. 1700, Prince of Catorp. 1709 to 1720, Sweden, second participation in the Third Great Northern War. Christian VI, 1730 to 1746, Frederick V, 1746 to 1766. Christian the Seventh. 1766 to 1784. 1772, overthrow Estonians. Frederick VI, 1784 to 1839. 1788, Sweden. 1801, England. 1807 to 1814, England, Danes in alliance with Napoleon. 1803 to 1809, Sweden, Danes in alliance with Russia. 1813 to 1814, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Sweden, ended by Peace of Kiel. Christian VIII, 1839 to 1848. Frederick VII, 1848 to 1863. 1848 to 1851, Revolts in Schleswig-Holstein. 1848 to 1849, Prussia and the German Confederation. 1849, Prussia. 1849 to 1850, German Confederation. Christian the Ninth, eighteen sixty three to nineteen oh six. Eighteen sixty four, Austrian Prussia, ended by Peace of Vienna. End of section four. Section five of Is War Diminishing by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Balzi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5. England As a broad general statement, it is fair to say that all nations have devoted about half their time to war and half to peace. The exact figures for the average of all nations here studied is 48% war and 52% peace for the period 1450 to 1900. England, in comparison with other countries, has done her share of fighting, perhaps a little more. She totals 419 war years in eight centuries, or 52.4%. Except for England and France, we have not carried the research into the period prior to 1450. But for these two countries, we are able to present the earlier dates, and these must be viewed with considerable interest. They extend the series backward by seven half centuries. 
and these, added to the nine latter half-centuries, give a long enough stretch to make one expect to come upon evidence of a declining curve, or general tendency for war periods to diminish. Such, however, is not the case either for England or France. The English figures are here given for the eighth century studied. A timeline graph is displayed on the page. These figures vary from 16 out of 50 to 39.5 out of 50. The first 400 years show 212 years of war. The second 400 years show 207. The difference of only 5 years is negligible in such a large total. Such facts as these, concerning as they do one of the dominant civilized nations of the earth, makes us pause in serious thought. It cannot be said that the latter wars were trivial in comparison to the earlier. It is true that a large number of the English wars in the 19th century were fought in distant climes to maintain the empire against inferior foes, and were small in comparison with the population of the realm. But on the other hand, many of the early wars, so-called, were merely insurrections soon stamped underfoot. Yes, England has been a conquering nation, and she has fought more than half of the time. Her three great maximum eras of belligerency occurred in the years 1100 to 1150, 1300 to 1450, 1550 to 1600. The chief generalization concerning these three periods is that they were all largely filled with combats against alien races, and were fought for the domination of these races. The long wars in the first part of the 12th century against Normandy and France were chiefly dynastic in their motives, and were to maintain Henry I in his possessions across the Channel. The second great period, 1300 to 1450, contains first the attempted conquest of Scotland and the Hundred Years' War, or the attempted conquest of France. All these had a strong personal and dynastic setting, though of course other motives entered. The third great era, 1550 to 1600, is represented by the struggle against Spain, commercial and partially religious in its, in its causation. It is to be noted that the Wars of the Roses, the Civil Wars of the Stuarts, and other internal dissensions in England do not swell the war years beyond the average point. This gives statistical support to the notion that England has on the whole been a well and a harmoniously governed country. England, 1100 to 1914. Henry I, 1100 to 1135. 1101, Robert of Normandy. 1102, Rebellion of Robert of Belesme. 1104-1106, Invasion of Normandy, both civil and foreign war. 1106-1128, A continuation of the war against Normandy and France. Stephen, 1135-1154. 1136-1138, Scottish Invasions, Battle of the Standards. 1138-1148, Civil War between Stephen and Matilda. 1149-1150, Civil War renewed between Stephen and Matilda. 1152-1153, Civil War, again, renewed between Stephen and Matilda. Henry II, 1154-1189. 1158-Welsh War. 1163, Second Welsh War. 1165, Third Welsh War. 1169-1172, War in Ireland. 1173-1174, Rebellion headed by Prince Henry. 1188 to 1189. France in alliance with princes Richard and John. Richard I, 1189 to 1199. 1190 to 1192, Third Crusade. 1194 to 1200, France. John, 1199, 1216. 1200 to 1202. Rebellion of the Pope nobles. 1202 to 1204. France in alliance with the Boictivan nobles, Bouvines. 1213 to 1214, France, the campaign of Bouvines. 1215 to 1216, France, John's last war. Regency, 1216 to 1227. 1216 to 1217, France. 1219 to 1223, Welsh War. 1223 to 1225, France. 1224, Welsh War. Henry the Third, 1227 to 1272. 1228 to 1231, Welsh War. 
1233 to 1234, Welsh War. 1241, Welsh War. 1241 to 1243, France, Henry III's loss of Poitou. 1245, France. 1257, War in Wales against Lelwyn and Griffith. 1259, France. 1263 to 1267, Civil War of Simon de Montfort against Henry III. Edward I. 1272-1307 1272-1276 Edward the First First Welsh War against Lelwyn 1277 A Continuation of the Welsh War 1282-1283 Third Welsh War against Lelwyn and David 1294-1298 France on sea and in Guying 1294-1295 Welsh War Fourth 1296, Conquest of Scotland. 1297 to 1304, Scottish War. 1306 to 1307, Bruce's Rebellion in Scotland. Edward II, 1307 to 1327. 1310, Scottish Expedition of Piers Gaveston. 1311 to 1323, Scotland. Bannockburn. 1321 to 1322, Revolt against Edward II. 1324 to 1327, France in Guyenne. 1326 to 1327, final revolt against Edward II. Regency, 1327 to 1330. 1326 to 1328, Scotland, Scottish independence Thirteen thirty two to thirteen fifty seven Scottish intervention in war thirteen thirty seven to thirteen forty France beginning of Bretagne of the Hundred Years War thirteen forty one to thirteen forty seven Renewal of Hundred Years War Campaign of Crecy Calais thirteen fifty five to thirteen fifty seven France Campaign of Poitiers thirteen fifty nine to thirteen sixty France End by Treaty of Bretigny 1367-1368, Interference of Castilian War in favour of Pedro. 1369-1375, France, Capture of the Mons. John of Gort's Expedition, Regency, 1377-1389. 1377-1380, France and Scotland. 1381, What Tyler's Rebellion. 1383-1389, France. Richard II, 1389 to 1399. 1385 to 1387, War of the Lords of Pelham in Scotland. 1388, Jerry Chase Campaign in Scotland and Northumberland. 1394 to 1395, First Irish Expedition. 1399, Second Irish Expedition. 1399, Lancaster's Expedition. Henry IV, 1399-1413 1400, Rebellion for Richard II in Rutland and elsewhere 1440-1409, Welsh Rebellion under Owen Glendower 1402-1403, Scottish Invasion under Douglas 1403, Percy's Rebellion 1405, Scroop's Rebellion 1405, Depredations of French Fleet off Welsh Coast 1406, Renewal of Hundred Years' War, 1408, Northumberland's Rebellion, 1411, Intervention in France in favour of the Burgundians, 1412, Intervention in France in favour of the Armagnacs. Henry V, 1413-1422, 1415-1420, France, ended by the Peace of Troyes, Agincourt, 1421-1422, France, last campaign of Henry V. Regency, 1422 to 1440. 1423 to 1439, France, English under Bedford, York and Warwick. Henry VI, 1440 to 1461. 1440 to 1444, France, ended by Angevin marriage treaty. 1448 to 1450, France, loss of Normandy, etc. 1450, Cade's Rebellion. 1450 to 1453, France, ended the Hundred Years' War and Failure. 1455, beginning of the Wars of the Roses. 
1459 to 1464, Wars of the Roses, ending with Lancastrian defeat at Hexham. Edward IV, 1461 to 1483, 1469 to 1471, Wars of the Roses, Lancastrian defeats at Barnet and Tewkesbury. 1475, Evasion of France and Peace of Pequingui. 1480, Scotland, ended by Treaty of Fotheringay. 1482 to 1484, Scotland. Richard III, 1483 to 1485. 1483, Buckingham's Rebellion. 1485, successful campaign of Henry Tudor for the crown. Henry VII, 1485 to 1509. 1486, Lavelle's Rising. 1487, Lambert Sinel's Rising. 1489 to 1492, France at Bretagne. 1495, Pekin Warbeck's first expedition for English crown. 1496 to 1497, Warbeck's second expedition. Henry VIII, 1509 to 1547. 1512 to 1514, France, Battle of Spurs. 1513 to 1513, Scotland, Campaign of Flodden Field. 1522 to 1523, Scotland. 1522 to 1525, France, Invasion of France of Failure. Amicable Loan. 1532 to 1534, Scotland. 1534 to 1535, Fitzgerald's Irish Expedition. 1542 to 1546, Scotland, Campaign of Solway Moss, etc. 1544 to 1546, France, Siege of Boulogne. Regency, 1547 to 1553. 1547 to 1548, Interference of Somerset in Scotland. 1548 to 1550, Scotland. 1548 to 1550, France. 1549, Rebellion in Devon. 1549, Kess Rebellion. Mary, 1553 to 1558. 1557 to 1559, France, loss of Calais. Elizabeth, 1558 to 1603. 1559 to 1560, Scotland and France entered by Treaty of Edinburgh. 1561 to 1567, Rebellion of Sean O'Neill in Ulster. 1562 to 1504, Alliance with Huguenots and Hampton Court in French War. 1569, Rising of Catholic Nobles in North of England. 1569 to 1583, Fitzmaurice and Munster Rebellion. 1585 to 1604, Spain, Armada Campaign. 1594 to 1603, Hugh O'Neill's Rebellion in Ulster. James I, 1603 to 1624. 1624 to 1625. English intervention in the Thirty Years' War. Charles I, 1624 to 1649. 1625 to 1630, Spain. 1627 to 1630, France, La Rochelle Expedition. 1639, First Bishop's War. 1640, Second Bishop's War. 1641 to 1643, Irish Rebellion. 1642 to 1646, First part of the Great Civil War. 1648, Second part of the Great Civil War. The Commonwealth, 1649 to 1660. 1649 to 1652, Cromwell's Irish War. 1650 to 1651, Scottish War, the invasion under Charles Stuart. 1652 to 1654, Holland, Blake vs. Ventrop. 1654 to 1659, Spain, ended by Peace of Pyrenees, 1655, Penredox Rising in Salisbury, 1655, Coercion of the Barbary States, Charles II, 1660 to 1685, 1661, Venice Rising, 1664 to 1667, Holland ended by Treaty of Breda, Capture of Dutch America, 1666 to 1667, France ended by Treaty of Breda. 1666 to 1667, Denmark ended by Treaty of Breda. 1672 to 1674, Holland, Charles II alliance with Louis XIV, Peace of Westminster. 1677 to 1679, rising other Coventries in Scotland. James II, 1685 to 1689. 1685. Monmouth's Rebellion. William and Mary, 1689 to 1702. 1688 to 1692. 
Struggle of William III against James II. 1688-1697. France and her allies. War of the League of Augsburg. 1700. Participation in Dano-Swedish War. And 1702-1714. 1701-1713. France and her allies. War of the Spanish Succession. George I, 1714-1727. 1715 to 1716, the Old Pretender. 1715 to 1719, naval action against Sweden. 1718 to 1720, Spain, War of the Quadruple Alliance. 1720 to 1721, naval action against Russia and her allies. George II, 1727 to 1760. 1727 to 1729, Spain, ended by Treaty of Seville. 1739 to 1748, Spain, War of Jenkins Ear. 1740 to 1748, France and Prussia, War of the Austrian Succession. 1745 to 1746, The Young Pretender. 1755 to 1763, France and her allies, Seven Years' War. George III, 1760 to 1811. 1762 to 1763, Spain, England in alliance with Portugal. 1763 to 1765, Emperor Shah Alam in India. 1764, Sepoy Mutiny. 1770, Friction with Spain and Falkland Islands. 1775 to 1783, War of American Independence, Treaty of Paris. 1788 to 1783, France in alliance with American revolutionists. 1778-1781. Margarita War. 1779-1783. Spain ended by Treaty of Paris. 1780-1783. Holland. 1792. Tipu Sahib. 1793-1802. France ended by Treaty of Amiens. 1795-1802. Holland, the ally of France. 1799. Tipu Sahib in alliance with Bonaparte. 1801, Denmark. 1802-1806, Marathas led by Holkar. 1803-1814, France ended by First Treaty of Paris. 1806, Sepoy Mutiny. 1807, Attack on Turks at Constantinople. 1807-1812, Russia, the ally of France in a continental system. George IV. Regent, 1811, King, 1820-1830. to 1812-1815, United States, Battle of New Orleans, after Treaty of Ghent. 1814-1815, War in Nepal. 1815, France, Le saint at Waterloo. 1816, Attack on Algiers. 1817, Pindari War. 1817-1881, Last Marita War. 1824-1826, War in Burma. 1827. Assistance to the Greeks against Turkey and Navarino. William IV. 1830-1837. 1831-1832. Action in Belgium. Victoria. 1837-1901. 1837. Rebellion in Canada. 1838-1842. War in Afghanistan. 1840-1841. Interference together with other powers. In Egyptian War. 1840-1842, Opium War in China. 1845, Interference in Uruguay. 1845, First Sikh War. 1848-1849, Second Sikh War. 1850-1852, War with the Kafirs. 1854-1856, Russia, Crimean War. 1856-1859, China, ended by Treaty of Tianjin. 1856-2057, Persia. 1857-2058, Sepoy Rebellion, Relief of Lucknow. 1861-1862, Participation Expedition to Mexico. 1863-1869, Maori War. 1867-1868, Abyssinian Expedition. 1874, Ashanti War. 1879, Zulu War. 1880-1881, War in the Transvaal. 1882-1834, Acquisition of Egypt. 1884-1885, Gordon-Sudan Expedition. 1884-1885, to 
Relief Expedition to Save Gordon. 1895. Reels Revolt in Canada. 1895 to 1889. War in Burma. 1895. War in India. 1895. Jameson Raid in South Africa. 1896. Ashanti Expedition. 1896 to 1900. War in Egypt. 1899 to 1902. Border Rebellion in South Africa. 1900. Participation in Suppression of Boxer Rebellion in China. Edward VII, 1901 to 1910. 1901 to 1902, Somaliland Expedition of English and Abyssinians. George V, 1910. 1914, Germany, Austria and Turkey. End of section 5. Section 6 of Is War Diminishing by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Balzi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 6. France. What was said for England may be said for France. Here we have eight centuries of the records of battles and no lessening in the time they fill. In fact, there is a slight increase from the first four centuries to the last four. The figures below represent the number of fighting years during each half century and century. A timeline graph is displayed on the page. The first portion of the records totals 181 years of war. The second totals 192.5. Thus, if we had paid attention alone to the second half of the record, we should have received an erroneous impression. The high mark, 31 years, during the half century, 1550 to 1600, and the two low marks, 18 to 17, during the 19th century, would have led to the false belief that French history gives evidence of decline of belligerent activity. It may be that the smaller figures, 18 and 17, are really significant and due to the heightening of civilization to moral causes not operative in the 12th and 13th centuries. The low figures in those centuries may have been due to causes more materialistic, economic or physical. This is possible. All we can say is, statistically, there is no warrant from the history of France or from the history of England that warfare is becoming less important or that it's engaging less of the time and attention of mankind with the slow and gradual development of social evolution. French wars have been frequent, though they have seldom been of great duration. Her longest period of war lasted 25 years, when the revolutionary and Napoleonic convulsion involved her continually in either foreign or civil war from 1789 to 1814. Her second longest continuous war period, 1635 to 1659, was a great struggle against the House of Habsburg, which included part of the Thirty Years' War against Austria and the Spanish War ending in the Peace of the Pyrenees. There was a great deal of fighting to the first half of the 13th century. These wars were more important for France. They prevented domination of the North by England and the South. They were wars of conquest. From 1400 to 1450, there was another period of excessive warfare. It was the last half of the Hundred Years' War, but it should be noted that the entire Hundred Years' War had many intermissions, so that during this period, about 40% of the years were of peace. The Third Great Era of Wars, 1550-1600, was less credible to France and not aid in any national upbuilding. This was the period of the Geysers, of Catherine de Medici and of the Huguenot Civil Wars. Thus the history of France shows somewhat more civil warfare than does that of England, but neither of these countries has been guilty of an excessive amount of internal destruction. It must be remembered that what we now call France was built up largely by conquests added from time to time to the nucleus that originally lay about Paris. Of course, France has been, on the whole, successful in war and a conquering country. Otherwise, the territory between Belgium, the Alps, the Pyrenees, and the Atlantic would not now be called France. France, 1100 to 1914. Louis VI, 1108 to 1137. 1104 to 1106, England. 1106-1128, England. 1108 to 1116, Civil War. Louis the Seventh, 1137 to 1180. 1142, War with Thibault de Campagne. 
1147 to 1149, Second Crusade. 1154 to 1155, Attack on Normandy. 1173 to 1174, aid given the revolting English princes. Philip Augustus, 1180 to 1223. 1188 to 1189, aid given Richard and John of England against Henry II. 1190 to 1191, Third Crusade. 1194 to 1200, England. 1202 to 1204, England. 1207 to 1208, War with Aquitaine. 1207 to 1215, Raymond of Toulouse, First Albigensian War, Crusade. 1213 to 1214, England, Campaign of Bouvines. 1215 to 1216, England. 1216 to 1217, England. 1216 to 1222, Raymond of Toulouse, Second Albigensian War. Louis VIII, 1223 to 1226, 1223 to 1225, England, 1223 to 1226, Third Albigensian War, Regency, 1226 to 1236, 1226 to 1229, Fourth Albigensian War, ended by Treaty of Paris, 1226 to 1231, Strife with the Barons, 1233 to 1234, Strife with the Barons, Louis the Ninth. 1236 to 1270. 1241 to 1243. England. Recovery of Poitou by the French. 1244. Fifth Albanesian War. An extermination of Albanesians. 1245. England. 1248 to 1254. Seventh Crusade. 1251. First Rising of the Pastoreau. 1253 to 1255. War in Flanders. 1259. England. 1268 Expeditions of Charles of Anjou in Italy. 1270 Eighth Crusade. Philip III, 1270 to 1285. 1276 Castile. Philip IV, 1285 to 1314. 1284 1291 Aragon. 1294 1298 England and Flanders. 1300 to 1305 War in Flanders. Campaign of Courtrai. 1314, War in Flanders. Louis X, 1314 to 1316. 1315, War in Flanders. Philip V, 1316 to 1322. 1320, Second Pastoral Rising. Charles IV, 1322 to 1328. 1324 to 1327, England in Guyenne. 1328, Flemish War, Campaign of Cassel. Philip VI, 1328-1350. 1337-1340, England, beginning of the Hundred Years' War. 1341-1347, England, campaign of Crecy, loss of Calais, Hundred Years' War. John II, 1350-1356. 1355-1357, England, campaign of Poitiers, Hundred Years' War. Charles V, 1356-1360. 1357-1358, rebellion of Etienne Marcel. 1359 to 1360, England, Hundred Years' War broken by peace of Bretigny. John the Second, 1360 to 1364. 1363 to 1364, War in Bretagne. Charles V, 1364 to 1380. 1365 to 1368, interference in the war in favour of Henry of Trastamara. 1369 to 1375, England. John of Gaunt's failure and French gains. 1377-1380, England, Hundred Years' War. Regency, 1380-1388. 1381-1382, Popular Risings in Paris, Les Melitonins, etc. 1382, War in Flanders, Campaign on Roosbeck. 1383, Repression in Northern France. 1383-1389, England, Hundred Years' War. Charles VI, 1388-1422 10,000 troops sent against the Turks 1405 Naval Resumption of Hundred Years' War 1405-1407 Civil War of Rogunians against Orleanists 1406 Renewal of Hundred Years' War 1408 Civil War resumed by Burgundians and Orleanists 1410 Civil War between Burgundians and Armagnacs, Orleanists. 
fourteen eleven to fourteen fifteen civil war between Burgundians and Aramax fourteen fifteen to fourteen twenty England campaign of Agincourt ended by Treaty of Troyes fourteen eighteen second Cabochian atrocities fourteen twenty one to fourteen twenty two England hundred years war End of section six Section 7 of Is War Diminishing by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Pulsey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 7. Holland. Years of War by Half Centuries and by Centuries. A timeline table is displayed on the page. From her sudden emergence as a real power during the third quarter of the 16th century, Holland has, with one exception, exhibited a steady line of diminution in warfare. Her history begins with the War of Liberation from the Spanish yoke, which is quite as bloody a page as any in the War Book of the Nations. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, however, she fought less and less, tracing a curve, the significance of which will be alluded to later. She took no slight part in the Thirty Years' War, and fought later against the Bourbon domination in Europe. The exception to a general downward tendency that is introduced by the French Revolution, when the little country was gathered in by France and taken in the measures of war, much against her will. Holland and Sweden are the only countries here tabulated that have been able to avoid war altogether in any period of fifty years, a fact due, perhaps, to impotence rather than to strength. Holland, 1566 to 1914. 1566 to 1567, revolt of the beggars. William the Silent, sir, 1575 to 1584. 1568 to 1579, War of Independence. Maurice of Nassau, 1584 to 1625. 1579 to 1609, War of Liberation against Spain after declaration. 1618, Overthrow of Alden Bandelt. Frederick Henry, 1625 to 1647. 1621 to 1648, continuation of war with Spain. William II, 1647 to 1650. The States, 1650 to 1672. 1652 to 1654, England. Van Tromp vs. Blake. 1657 to 1661, Portugal. 1658 to 1660, Sweden, part of the Second Great Northern War. 1664 to 1665, hostilities with England. 1665 to 1667, open war with England and by Treaty of Breda. 1667 to 1668, France, War of Devolution. William III, 1672 to 1702. 1672 to 1674, England ended by Treaty of Westminster. 1672 to 1678, France ended by Treaty of Nimtwegen. 1675 to 1679, Sweden. 1688 to 1697, France, War of the League of Augsburg. 1700, Intervention in the Third Great Northern War. The States, 1702 to 1747. 1701 to 1718, France. War of the Spanish Succession, 1719 to 1720, Spain, War of the Quadruple Alliance, 1743 to 1748, France, War of the Austrian Succession, 1747, Orange Revolution, William IV, 1747 to 1751, Regency, 1751 to 1759, Republic, 1759 to 1766, William V, 1766 to 1795, 1780 to 1783, England. 1785, Democratic Rights. 1786, Democratic Rights. 1793 to 1795, France and by creation of Batavian Republic. Republic, 1795 to 1805. 1795 to 1802, England, Holland, the ally of France. Louis Bonaparte, 1806 to 1810. 1798 to 1813. As ally of France, Holland followed her in every war. 1813 to 1814, revolt against the French regime. 
William I, King of the Netherlands, 1815 to 1840. 1815, France, Licence Jewish and Waterloo. 1830, Separation of Belgium from Holland. End of section 7. Section 8 of Is War Diminishing by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Pulsey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 8. The Old Kingdom of Poland. A timeline graph is displayed on the page. The above war statistics of the Old Kingdom of Poland give us a figure with a gradual rise to an apex, a consistent increase in war from 1450 to the second half of the 17th century, when the deluge, as Sankiewicz calls this cataclysm, bade fair to sweep the nation out of existence. After 1700, there was a remarkable falling off in war years. Wars were numerous in the days of Casimir IV, who ruled in the last quarter of the 15th century, and the time of Sigismund I in the first part of the 16th, but they were even more engaging in the second half of that cycle, when the Poles, distracted by constant changes of dynasty, embarked in the First Great Northern War. There was at that time a very conscious rivalry with a huge Slavic power to the east, and Poland revealed great military possibilities. A line of brilliant captains succeeded Stephen Pathery, the energetic Transylvanian prince, who was elected to fill the throne made vacant in 1574 by the rapid flight of Henry of Alois. Stephen fought some of the most splendid campaigns in all Polish history, driving Ivan the Terrible back and forcing him to peace. But the reign of this great man was brief, 1575-1586. After Stephen's death, Jan Samuelski, the great chancellor, carried on the tradition. Although like Bathory and all the Polish commanders, he was hampered more than aided by the obstructive diet at Warsaw. Indeed, Poland had almost steadily advanced in prosperity since the beginning of the Jagiellonic period, in 1386 to its close in 1572, then under Stephen Bathory, 1575 to 1586. Her importance continued to grow so that she was universally recognized as the great power of Eastern Europe. Her geographical limits were widely extended. With Lithuania united, she stretched to the eastward and northward into much of what is now Russia. To the south she touched the Black Sea at Ackermann, and included much of what is now Austria and Romania. On the east she extended for 100 miles into what is now Prussia, reaching through to the Baltic Sea at Dunzig. During her era of greatness, Poland fought about half of the time, 54, 52 and 58 percent. This ratio grew to 64 and 72 percent for the next two half centuries, which era may be called the beginning of her political decline. After the year 1700, the amount of time devoted to warfare declined very considerably, being 33 and 11% for the next two half-centuries, out of which Poland ceased to exist as a political entity. The summarization seems to be that three periods are found in Polish history. During the first, she was politically a great power and fought an average amount. During the second, she declined in prestige, fighting more than an average amount. During the third, she declined in political strength and greatly in the amount of her belligerency. Poland, 1540-1795 Casimir IV, 1447-1492 1454-1466, Livonian Order 1471-1479, Matthias Korvin Hunadi of Hungary 1486-1489, Turkey 1490, Raid of Cossacks, Tatars, Magyars, etc. John Albert 1492 to 1501. 1492-1494. War between Lithuania and Moscow. 1497. Short Turkish War. 1497-1498. Stephen of Moldavia. Alexander. 1501-1506. 1500-1503. Moscow. 1500-1506. Stephen of Moldavia. 1506. Khan of the Crimea. Sigismund I. 1506 to 1548, 1508 Moscow, 1510 Tata Raid, 1511 to 1526 Russia, 1516 Tata Raid, 1519 Tata Raid, 1520 to 1521 Livonian Order, 1527 Tata Raid, 1530 Moldavia, 
1533, Russia. Sigismund II, 1548-1572, Interference in Wallachia, 1556-1557, Livonian Order, Beginning of the First Great Northern War, Interregnum, 1572 1573 Henry of Valois, 1573-1574, Stephen Bathory, 1575-1586, 1572 to 1575, Russia. 1575, Tatar invasion. 1583 to 1590, Turkish war along border. Sigismund III, 1587 to 1632. 1587 to 1588, Archduke Maximilian and the Sobolewski. 1590, Confederation against Samoyski. 1595, Turkey. 1596, Cossacks put down by Solkowski, 1598 to 1600, Cossacks again put down by Solkowski, 1600 to 1609, Sweden, 1606, Confederation of Sebrotovsky, 1607 to 1609, Insurrection of Sebrotovsky, 1609 to 1618, Russia arose out of Russia's anarchy, 1613, Cossack expedition in Black Sea, 1615 to 1616, Cossack rebellion, 1617, Cossack Rebellion. 1618 to 1621, Turkey. 1623 to 1625, Cossacks who were subdued. 1626 to 1629, Sweden, campaign of Gustavus Adolphus. Wadislaus IV. 1632 to 1648. 1632 to 1634, Russia ended by Treaty of 1632-1634, Turkey, 1634, Cossack Revolt, 1636, Cossack Revolt, 1638, Cossack Revolt, 1638, Attack on Danzig and Destruction of Fleet by Danes, 1646-1648, Tartar and Turkish Raids in Poland, John Casimir, 1648-1668, 1648-1649, Tatar Khan of Crimea and war with Poland. 1648-1649, Cossack Rebellion, headed by Chmielnytsky. 1651-1654, Cossack Rebellion as a succession from Poland. 1654-1656, Russia ended by armistice of Vilna. 1655-1660, Sweden the deluge in Poland, ended by peace of Oliwa. 1656-1657, Brandenburg, and by Treaty of Wellau, freeing Prussia. 1657-1662, Rogoxy of Transylvania. 1658-1667, Renewal of Russian War, and by Peace of Andrasovo. 1667-1668, Cossacks and Tatars headed by Doroshenk. Michael Wisniewski, 1669-1673. 1672, Turkey. John III, Sobieski, 1674 to 1696. 1673 to 1675, Turkey. 1683 to 1699, Turkey, Sobieski's Vienna Triumph. Augustus II, 1697 to 1704. Stanislaus Lezajinski, 1704 to 1709. 1701 to 1706, Sweden, and Empire Truce, which was made permanent. Augustus III, 1733 to 1763, 1733 to 1735, War of the Polish Succession against Russia. Stanislaus II, Boniatowski, 1764 to 1795, 1768 to 1772, War of the Confederation of Bar, leading to First Partition. 1792, Resistance to Russia and the Second Partition. 1794, Russia leading to the Third Partition. 1795, Prussia, leading to the Third Partition. End of section 8
Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 9. Hohenzollern Prussia. The German Empire from 1871. Prussian military history may be divided into two parts. First, that of the standing mercenary army developed by Frederick William I and Frederick the Great, which fell into ignominious decrepitude and was defeated at Falmy, Chenna, and Orestat. And second, that of the nation in arms, an idea which Prussia had led in developing from Scharnhorst on through William I, Rude and Bismarck to William II. The figures for Prussia commence in these statistics in 1618, the year when the electorate of Brandenburg and the Duchy of Prussia were united, and was essentially historic Prussia made her appearance in European politics. After 1871, the German Empire succeeds Prussia, starting with a very high figure for the Thirty Years' War, 1618 and 1648, during most of which the elector, though not at war, could not prevent the utter devastation of his territories by the belligerents. Prussia has lowered her war curve almost steadily until a surprisingly peaceful record of 4% was reached, and that in the time of Bismarck. It is rather a curious fact, the one worth commenting on, that on the 17th century, in the days of the mild and weak George William, Prussia should have been visited by a great amount of war, and that during the last two generations, under a notoriously military regime, her war years should have declined to about the lowest of any nation in history. The real lesson to be drawn from this is not that preparedness makes for peace, but rather that history contains many anomalous phenomena. Even in a long sequence of instances, it should be found that a majority of the wars came to nations relatively unprepared, and that the stronger military powers tended to maintain themselves in states of peace. It would be right to draw the obvious conclusions. It would be possible, if we had a systematic compilation of the wars of a great many nations, to get some light upon this problem. In the meantime, we should withhold opinion. Blow the figures for Prussia showing the decline of war years, given by half-centuries and by centuries. A timeline table is displayed on the page. Prussia, 1618 to 1871. Germany, 1871 to 1914. George William, 1619 to 1640. 1625 to 1653, parts of the realm occupied by belligerents and by Swedes. 1626 to 1629, Sweden in Prussia. 1631 to 1635, war against the empire, in by acceptance of peace of Prague. 1635 to 1640, Sweden. Frederick William, 1640 to 1688. 1651, Newburgh. 1656-1657, Poland ended by Peace of Werlau. 1657-1660, Sweden, Alliance of Werlau with Poland and Austria. 1672-1673, France ended by Peace of Wossum. 1674-1679, France ended by Peace of St. Germain in Ley. 1675-1679, Sweden ended by Peace of St. Germain in Ley, Further Berlin. Frederick I, 1688-1713 1688-1697, France, War of the League of Augsburg 1701-1713, France and her allies, War of the Spanish Succession Frederick William I, 1713-1740 1715-1720, Sweden Frederick II the Great, 1740-1786 1740-1742, Austria First Silesian War ended by Peace of Breslau, 1744 to 1745, Austria. Second Silesian War ended by Peace of Dresden, 1756 to 1763, Austria. Third Silesian War, Seven Years' War ended by Peace of Hubertsburg, 1756 to 1763, France. Seven Years' War ended by Peace of Paris, 1757 to 1762, Russia. Seven Years' War ended by Peace of Paris. 1757 to 1762, Sweden, Seven Years' War, ended by Peace of Paris. 1788 to 1779, Austria, War of the Bavarian Succession, ended by Peace of Teschen. Frederick William II, 1786 to 1797. 1792 to 1795, France, ended by Peace of Basel. 1794 to 1795, Poland, leading to the Third Partition. 
Frederick William III, 1797-1840. 1806-1807, France. 1807, ended by Treaty of Tilsit. 1812, Russia, ended by Convention of Tarragon. 1812-1814, France, ended by First Treaty of Paris. 1813-1814, Denmark, the ally of France. 1815, France, the Saint Jules in Waterloo. Frederick William IV, 1840-1861. part in putting down Krakow insurrection. 1848, riots in Berlin. 1848-1849, First War of Schleswig-Holstein against Denmark. 1849, Denmark, Second War of Schleswig-Holstein. 1849, Intervention in Biden. William I, 1861-1888. 1864, Denmark and by Peace of Vienna. 1866, Austria and by Peace of Prague. 1870-1871, France and by Peace of Frankfurt. Frederick III, 1888-1888. William II, 1888. 1914, Russia, France, England, Belgium, Serbia, Japan, War of the Alliances. End of section 9. Section 10 of Is War Diminishing by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Balzi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 10. Russia. Russia, whatever may be the reason, has been obliged, in the fulfilment of her destiny, to engage in an unusual number of wars, many of them covering vast stretches both of time and of area. The great war epochs came, apparently, by fits and starts at intervals of about a century and a half. The age of Ivan the Great, 1462 to 1505, was one of great struggles, culminating in the final expulsion of the Tatars and the self-assertion of the autocrat over the great sea of Novgorod, and in a new and defiant attitude on the part of Russia in regard to Poland-Lithuania, her western neighbour. The half-century that followed was Russia's most warlike, with its battling against the Livonian order of knights and against Poland, a survival of the old struggle of German and Slav, which again today is uppermost. At the same time, Tatars raided the land and stirred up rebellion continually in Kazan. Every man's hand was against his neighbour in the last decade of the half-century, when Ivan the Terrible was in his minority. From 83% in the age just referred to, Russia's curve sinks only to 72% in the second half of the cycle, that of the first great northern war, when Ivan the Terrible first made Russia a great Baltic power. Then came the troublous times, and all that had been gained was lost for a while, and the tragic faces of Boris Godunov, the first and second false Dmitri, Maria, and the rest appear and pass on. Russia was an anarchy until 1613, when patriotic Rysons brought the House of Romanov to the throne. The more peaceful times that followed make the war figure of 1600 to 1650 a fairly low one. The next raising of the curve comes with the Second Great Northern War, that of the Deluge, when Russia fought Poland, Sweden, and against Poland. The complications of the Cossack Wars and the last years of the century trouble with Turkey added to the war record. The 18th century was one of shorter wars, during which Russia prepared herself up to the preponderant role which it was to play in the first part of the 19th century, when her war curve rose again. Part of the increase was imparted by the Napoleonic conflict, but Russia's eastward expansion brought other complications, and the conquest of the Caucasus, while involving no huge army, was the work of many years. This was the epoch of Russian penetration into Central Asia. The very high percentage of war years found in the history of Russia during her dark and early period would probably on first thought be ascribed to her then backward state of evolution. But this does not seem to be a justified inference. If England and France in their more archaic periods showed an increase in war activity, there would be a point of suggestion here in regard to Russia. Furthermore, the Russian war curve does not decline more than a little for the whole 450 years here presented. It was 71% as late as 1800-1850. to 
Also, Holland, Spain, and Sweden fought from 75 to 95 percent of the time during their areas of greatest civilization. These considerations show the value of the comparative method in historical generalization, even if, as in this case, it has a negative value. A timeline table is displayed on the page, Russia's Years of War. Russia, 1450 to 1914. 1450 to 1453. Civil War with Shemyaka. 1455 to 1461. Tatars. 1465. Repression of Novgorod. 1458 to 1459. Suppression of Faithka. 1463. Swedish Raid. Ivan the Great. 1462 to 1505. 1464 to 1465, slight war with Svetkov. 1465, Tatar inroad. 1466 to 1467, raids in Finland against Swedes. 1467 to 1469, expedition against Kazan. 1468, Tatars. 1471, suppression of Novgorod. 1472, conquest of Permia. 1472, Tatars. 1478, final suppression of Novgorod. 1480, Tatar Invasion, Unsuccessful Campaign of Akhmet. 1480-1483, Livonian Order. 1485, Conquest of Tver. 1487, Capture of Kazan. 1489, Subjection of Vaitka. 1491-1510, Sweden. 1492-1494, Lithuania. 1496-1497, Rebellion in Kazan. 1499-1500, Transural Expedition. 1500-1503, Lithuania and the Livonian Order. 1503-1509, War continued with the Livonian Order alone. Vasily V, 1505-1533. 1506, Expedition against Kazan. 1508, Poland-Lithuania. 1511-1526, Poland-Lithuania. 1521, Rebellion in Kazan. 1524, Expedition to Kazan. 1527-1529, Tatar Invasions. 1530-1531, Kazan. 1533-1533, Tatar Invasions. Regency, 1533-1547. 1534-1537, Poland-Lithuania. 1535-1535, Tatar Invasion. 1535, Rebellion of Kazan. 1538-1547, Country overrun by foes on every side during minority. Ivan the Terrible, 1547-1584. 1547, Expedition against Kazan. 1549-1553, Final War on Kazan. 1554-1555, Conquest of Astrakhan. 1554-1557, Sweden. 1557-1561, Livonian Order. 1559-1561, Sweden. 1561-1570, Livonian Order in Denmark. 1561-1571, Poland. 1569, Tatars. 1571, Tatar Raids. 1572-1583, Sweden. 1572, Tatar Raids. 1575-1582, Poland ended by Treaty of E.M. Sapolsky. 1581-1582, Ermax Expedition to Conquer Siberia. Theodore I. 1584 to 1598, 1590 to 1595, Sweden, 1591 to 1594, Tatar Khan, 1595, Expedition against Kuchum, 1598, Expedition against Kuchum, Boris Kudunov, 1598 to 1605, 1601 to 1604, Famine at Brigandage, 1604 to 1605, Invasion of Russia by the First False Dmitry, 1605, Expedition to Dagestan. 1606. Overthrow the first false Dmitri. Vasily Zhivsky. 1606 to 1610. 1607 to 1610. War of the second false Dmitri, the Brigand of Tushino. 1607 to 1609. Sweden. 1609 to 1618. Poland. Interregnum. 1610 to 1613. 1610 to 1611. Sweden. Michael Romanov. 1613 to 1645. 1613 to 1617. Sweden, ended by Peace of Strolbov. 
1632-1634, Poland, NY Treaty of Polyanovka, 1633, Tardine Roads, Regency, 1645-1650, 1648, Ryder, Moscow, Alexis, 1650-1676, 1654-1656, Poland, and by Armistice of Vilna, 1656-1658, Sweden, and by Truce of Veliskar, Peace of Codis, 1661. 1658-1659. War against Vygovsky and part of the Cossacks. 1658-1667. Poland and by Peace of Atrasovo. 1668-1681. The Cossacks of the right bank of the Dnieper. 1669-1671. Revolt of Stenko Rezin. Fyodor III. 1676-1682. 1672-1681, Tartars ended by a peace between Tsar and Sultan. Regency, 1682-1689. Revolt of the Strelsti. 1684, Less Important Revolt of the Strelsti. 1687-1699, Turkey, the first with Turkey herself. 1689, Fighting with the Chinese in the Amur Valley. Peter the Great, 1689 to 1725. 1695 to 1696. Expedition to Azov. 1698. Last revolt of the Strelsky. 1700 to 1721. Sweden. Third Great Northern War. Ended by peace in Istad. 1705. Revolt in Astrakhan. 1711 to 1712. Turkey. Ended by peace of Pruth. 1720 to 1721. English fleet in war against Russia. 1722, Persia. Catherine the First, 1725 to 1727. Regency, 1727 to 1730. Ain, 1730 to 1740. 1733 to 1735, Poland and France, or the Polish succession. 1725 to 1739, Turkey and by Peace of Belgrade. Regency, 1740 to 1741. 1741 to 1743, Sweden, and a white piece of O. Elizabeth, 1741 to 1762. 1757 to 1762, Prussia, Seven Years' War. Catherine II, 1762 to 1796. 1768 to 1772, War against the Confederation of Bar. 1768 to 1774, Turkey, in by Treaty of Kuchak Kainaraj. 1773 to 1774, Bugacheta Revolt. 1783 to 1784, Seizure of the Crimea. 1787-1792, to Turkey ended by Peace of Jesse. 1788-1790, to Sweden ended by Peace of Virilu. 1792, Attack on Poland, leading to Second Partition. 1794, Struggle leading to the Third Partition of Poland. 1795-1796, to Persia. Paul, 1796-1801. 1798 to 1800, France, Russia joining the Second Coalition. 1804 to 1813, Persia. Alexander I, 1810 to 1825. 1805 to 1807, France, the one of the Third Coalition, ended by Peace of Tilsit. 1806 to 1812, Turkey, ended by Treaty of Bucharest. 1807 to 1812, England. 1808 to 1809, Sweden, and the acquisition of Finland. Peace of Fredericham. 1809. Austria, a nominal war as ally of France. 1812 to 1814. France, ended by the First Treaty of Paris. 1812. Prussia, the ally of France, ended by Convention of Torogen. 1812 to 1813. Austria. 1813 to 1814. Denmark, the ally of France. 1815. France. Nicholas I, 1825 to 1855. 1825, Rising of the Decembrists. 1826 to 1828, Persia. 1827, Turkey, aid given the Greeks at Navarino. 1828 to 1829, Turkey, ended by Treaty of Adrianople. 1829 to 1864, War in the Lycian Hills against Shamil. 1830 to 1832, Revolt in Poland. 1839 to 1842, War in Kiva. 
1840 to 1841, aid given Prussia and Austria at Krakow, then revolt. 1849, aid given Austria and Hungary and the capitulation of Velikos. 1853 to 1856, Turkey ended by Treaty of Paris, Crimean War. 1854 to 1856, England ended by Treaty of Paris, Crimean War. 1854 to 1856, France ended by Treaty of Paris, Crimean War. 1855 to 1856, Sardinia ended by Treaty of Paris, Crimean War. Alexander II, 1855 to 1881. 1861, Rise in Poland. 1863, Insurrection in Poland, War Restored in Poland. 1865, Conquest of Turkestan. 1868, Conquest of Bukha. 1873, Conquest of Kiva. 1876, Conquest of Kokand. 1877-1878, Turkey ended by Treaty of Berlin. 1881, Subjection of the Last Turkmen Tribes. Alexander III, 1881-1894. Nicholas II, 1894. 1900, 1900 Participation and Suppression of Boxer Rebellion. 1904-1905, Japan ended by Treaty of Portsmouth. 1914, Germany, Austria and Turkey. End of Section 10「Section 11 of Is War Diminishing」by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Bolte. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 11. Spain The war curve for Spain shows very high percentages, especially from 1450 to 1700, 76, 55, 91, 96, 68, our percentages exceeded nowhere in this research except for the same period in the history of Turkey. While it is true that the second half of her history is more peaceful than the first, the whole distribution of dates cannot be considered very encouraging to those who hope for universal peace. The lowest percentage, 28, occurs 1750 to 1800, while the 19th century averages more than 50% of war. In a general way, it may be said that Spain fought more in the era when she was great than the days of her degeneracy. Her entire history may be divided into three periods. In the first, 1450 to 1600, she was strong, fighting 74% of the time. In the second, 1600 to 1750, she disintegrated, fighting 74.3% of the time. In the third, she remained weak, fighting 45% of the time. The great harmfulness of the third period was that her wars were fought to no purpose and were to a great extent internal disturbances. The great trouble with the wars of the middle period was that she lost them. Below are the years of war during each half century and century. A timeline table is displayed on the page. Spain, 1479 to 1914. Fernand and Isabella, 1479 to 1504. 1476 to 1492, the Moors of Spain. 1479, Portugal. 1480, Moroccan Expedition. 1487, Moroccan Expedition. 1490, Moroccan Expedition. 1495 to 1497, France in Italy. 1497, Moroccan Expedition. 1501, Revolt of the Moriscos. 1501. Revolt in Naples, Spain, aiding the French. 1502 to 1504, France in Italy. Ferdinand, Regent, 1504 to 1516. 1508 to 1510, Venice, War of the League of Cambrai. 1509 to 1510, African Conquests of Cisneros. 1511 to 1513, France, War of the Holy League. Charles V, 1517 to 1566. 1519 to 1521. Conquest of Mexico by Hernando Cortes. 1520 to 1521. Revolt of the Communides. 1521 to 1526. First war against Francis I of France, ended by Treaty of Madrid. 1521 to 1527. The Pope in Venice, the sack of Rome. 1526 to 1529. Second War Against Francis I, ended by Peace of Cambrai. 1531-1535, Conquest of Peru by Francisco Pizarro. 1535, 
Expedition against Tunis. 1536 to 1538. Third war against Francis I. Ended by peace of Nice. 1536 to 1541. Civil war in Peru. 1541. Expedition against Algiers. 1542 to 1544. Fourth war against Francis I. Ended by peace of Crepy. 1552 to 1559, France ended by peace of Cateau Cambrésis. 1559 to 1564, Turkey. Philip II, 1566 to 1598. 1566 to 1567, Revolt of the Dutch Beggars. 1568 to 1609, War of the Dutch Independence. 1569 to 1580, Turkey, Campaign of Lampanto. 1569-1571, Revolt of the Moriscos in Spain. 1579-1582, War against Don Antiono in Portugal. 1585-1604, England, Campaign of the Armada. 1589-1598, France, Spain, the ally of the Catholic League. 1591, Revolt in Zaragoza. Philip III, 1598-1621. 1604, Expedition against the Turks. 1610 and 1614, Turkey. 1615 and 1617, Savoy. 1617 and 1621, Venice. 1618 and 1619, Turkey. Philip IV, 1621 and 1665. 1620 to 1648, Participation in the Thirty Years' War. 1621 and 1648, Resumption of War with Holland. 1625 to 1630, England, 1629-1631, France, War of the Mantua in Succession, 1631, Rebellion in Vizcaya, 1635-1659, France ended by the Peace of the Pyrenees, 1637, Riots in Portugal, 1639-1659, Separatist War in Catalonia, 1640-1668, War of Portuguese Independence, 1641, Revolt in Andalusia, 1646 to 1647, revolts in Sicily. 1647 to 1648, revolts in Naples. 1654 to 1659, England. Regency. 1665 to 1679. 1666 to 1667, Barbary States. 1667 to 1668, France, War of Devolution. 1672 to 1678, France, and by peace of Nimtwigan. 1672 to 1673, Barbary States. Charles II, 1679 to 1700. 1681, Barbary States. 1683 to 1684, France. 1688 to 1697, France, War of the League of Augsburg. 1688 to 1689, Barbary States. 1693 to 1694, Barbary States. Philip V, 1700 to 1745. 1701 to 1713, Ally of France against Austria, England, Holland, etc. 1705 to 1715, Rebellion in Catalonia. 1717, Seizure of Sardinia. 1718 to 1720, England, France, Austria, Holland, War or the Quadruple Alliance. 1727 to 1729, England. 1733 to 1735, Austria, War of the Polish Succession. 1739 to 1748, England, War of Jenkins' Ear. 1740 to 1748, Ally of France, the War of the Austrian Succession. Ferdinand VI, 1745 to 1759. Charles III, 1759 to 1788. 1762 to 1763, England and Portugal. 1766, Riots in Madrid. 1770, Trouble of England in the Falkland Islands. 1775, Moroccan War. Charles IV, 1788 to 1808. 1779 to 1783, England, ended by Treaty of Versailles. 1783 to 1784, War on Arakel. 1793 to 1795, France, ended by Treaty of Basel. 1796 to 1802, England, Spain, the ally of France. 1801, war with Portugal. 1804 to 1808, England, Spain, the ally of France. 
Joseph Bonaparte, 1808. 1808 to 1814. Revolt of the Spanish people against the French. Fernand the 7th, 1814 to 1833. 1808 to 1823. Revolt and separation of Spain's American colonies. 1816 to 1819. Revolts against Ferdinand the 7th. 1820. Revolt of Del Riego, etc. 1821 to 1823. Revolts against the king leading to French intervention. 1830. Liberal revolt. Isabella II, 1833 to 1868. 1833 to 1840. Revolt of Don Carlos. 1841. Riots. 1844. Revolts in Cuba and Manila. 1846. Revolts in Spain. 1847. Carlos War. 1851. Cuban Revolt. 1854. Risings in Spain. 1859 to 1860. Morocco. 1861 to 1862. Participation in Mexican Expedition of Maximilian. 1866. Liberal Revolt. 1868. September Revolution under Brim's leadership. Provisional Government and Regency, 1868 to 1869. 1868 to 1878, Human Revolt. 1869, Spain and Anarchy. Amadeo, 1870 to 1873. 1872 to 1885, Third Carlos War. Republic, 1873 to 1875. 1873 to 1875, Spain and Anarchy. Alfonso the Twelfth, eighteen seventy five to eighteen eighty five Regency, eighteen eighty five to nineteen oh two eighteen ninety five to eighteen ninety eight Cuban Revolution eighteen ninety eight the United States ended by Peace of Paris End of chapter eleven Section twelve of Is War Diminishing by Ferrex Adams Woods and Alexandra Bolte. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 12. Sweden. The curve for Sweden forms the outline of two apexes, one considerably higher than the other. The first of the two reaches 79% in the half a century, 1600-1650. This was the era of the Thirty Years' War of Charles IX, Gustavus Adolphus and Oxen Steiner, of constant wars in Germany and Livonia, Denmark or Russia. It was the epoch of the Swedish Empire, if so it may be termed. This period of great wars went on for a decade after the middle of the century. The Second Great Northern War found Charles X, 1654 to 1660, at the head of an army which, for fighting ability, endurance and general command, could not be matched in Europe unless Cromwell's iron sides had been set beside them. Swedish infantry had replaced Spanish infantry as an expression of highest efficiency. The Swedish Empire was of short duration, however, and at Fairbellin in 1675, the great elector of Brandenburg dealt it a telling blow. This half-century, 1650-700, to 700, was one of only 21% of war. It was followed by the Lesser Apex, the Third Great Northern War. When that mad genius, Charles XII, marched over all the countries of the north to find himself, in the end, a beaten fugitive at Bender, where Turkish hospitality afforded a poor consolation. With the termination of this last great northern war in 1721, Sweden ceased to rank as a great power, and her battles became less frequent. Her part in the Seven Years' War was at no time impressive. A few disastrous and important wars with Russia when Sweden lost Finland and a participation in the Napoleonic struggles were the only serious contests in the last two centuries. When Sweden was a great power, she fought her maximum years of war. She has not been a fighter since. In this respect, Sweden resembles Holland and both differ from Spain, where a civil war took the place of the grand wars of the earlier centuries. Sweden, like Holland and Denmark, has shown herself fairly well capacitated for self-government and the maintenance of continued peace. Her civil wars have not been unusually frequent. Her early wars against Denmark in the period 1453 to 1500, though almost civil wars, says it was a continually recurring question at this time whether the two northern kingdoms should or should not remain under the same joint ruler, were not sufficiently numerous to raise the Irish to more than 43%. It was only her endurance into a career of conquest and a challenge of great European kingdoms 
and of the empire that raised her war percentage to 77, an amount so frequently seen for other nations when exercising political importance. The war years of Sweden are here given by half centuries and by centuries. A timeline table is displayed on the page. Sweden, 1450 to 1914. Confused and disputed bull, 1446 to 1523. 1451 to 1457, war in Sweden against Christian I of Denmark. 1463 to 1465, Denmark and Scania. 1467 to 1471, second war against Christian I of Denmark, Battle of Brunkenberg. 1491 to 1510, Russia. 1496 to 1497, war between John of Sweden and Sterno Stuart, administrator. 1501 to 1513, Denmark, war waged by the Stuart family largely. 1516 to 1520, Denmark conquered Sweden, massacred at Stockholm. 1521 to 1524, war of liberation led by Gustavus Vasa and by peace of Melamo. Gustavus Vasa, 1523 to 1560. 1534 to 1536, Lubeck, 1554 to 1557, Russia ended by peace of Moscow. 1559 to 1561, Russia, Sweden, the ally of the Livonian order. Eric, the 14th, 1560 to 1568. 1563 to 1570, Denmark, ended by peace of Stettin. John the 3rd, 1568 to 1592. 1572 to 1583, Russia, in Baltic provinces, ended by a prolonged truce. Sigismund, 1592 to 1595. 1590 to 1595, Russia, ended by peace of Tenzin. Sigismund and Charles, 1595 to 1600. 1598, war against King Sigismund, ended by a convention at Linkoping. Charles IX. 1600 to 1611. 1600 to 1611. Denmark ended by a truce. War of Kalmar. 1600 to 1609. Poland. 1607 to 1609. Russian expedition to aid Basil Shuiski, etc. 1609 to 1611. Russia against no organized government. Gustavus Adolphus. 1611 to 1632. 1613 to 1617, Russia against Tsar Michael, ended by peace of Strolbowo. 1616 to 1618, Denmark, ended by a truce. 1620 to 1622, Denmark, ended by a truce. 1625 to 1626, Denmark, ended by a truce. 1626 to 1628, Denmark, ended by a truce. 1626 to 1629, war with the Elector Duke of Prussia. 1628-1629, Denmark, War of Kalmar, and a by truce of Altmark. Region Z, 1632-1644, 1630-1648, The Empire and its Allies, Thirty Years' War. Christina, 1644-1654, 1643-1645, Denmark and by peace of Bronzeburg. Charles X, 1654 to 1660. 1655 to 1600. Poland. Charles X claimed Polish throne and by peace of Olewa. 1656 to 1658. Russia and by three year truce. Peace of Curtis, 1661. 1657 to 1658. Denmark and by peace of Roskilde. 1657 to 1660, Brandenburg, Prussia, ended by peace of Valois. 1657 to 1660, the Empire, ended by peace of Valois. 1658 to 1660, Denmark, ended by Treaty of Copenhagen. Regency, 1660 to 1672, 1665 to 1666, Bremen, ended by Treaty of Habensorzen. Charles XI. 1672 to 1697. 1675 to 1679. Brandenburg, Prussia. Ludenburg and Munster. 1675 to 1679. 
the Empire, ended by Treaty of Nimjewagen. 1675 to 1679, Denmark, ended by Peace of Lund. 1675 to 1679, Holland, ended by Peace of Nimjewagen. Charles XII, 1697 to 1718. 1699 to 1700, Denmark, ended by Peace of Trevendal. 1700 to 1721, Russia, ended by Peace of Neustadt. 1700 to 1706, Saxony, ended by Treaty of Old Poland also. 1709 to 1719, Saxony and Poland, ended by a truce which was made permanent. 1709 to 1720, Denmark. 1715 to 1719, Naval Action of England against Sweden. 1715 to 1720, Prussia. Ulrika Eleanor, 1719 to 1720. 1719 to 1720, Hanover. Frederick I, 1720 to 1751. 1741 to 1743, Russia ended by Peace of Abel. Adolphus Frederick, 1751 to 1771. 1775 to 1762, Prussia ended by Peace of Hamburg. Gustavus III, 1771 to 1792. 1788 to 1790, Russia ended by Peace of Verlt. 1788, Denmark, the ally of Russia. Gustavus IV, 1792 to 1809. 1805 to 1810, France ended by Peace of Paris, War of the Third Coalition. 1808 to 1809, Russia ended by Peace of Feindrichem. 1808 to 1809, Denmark, the ally of Russia. Charles XIII, 1809 to 1819. 1813 to 1814, Denmark, Sweden in alliance with powers, Peace of Kiel. 1813 to 1814, France, Sweden in alliance with powers. 1815, France. End of chapter 12. Section 13 of Is War Diminishing? by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Balsey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 13. Turkey A timeline table displayed on the page, Years of War. The figures given in the tables for Turkey include only her European possessions. The Asiatic wars are excluded for lack of accurate data, and because, after all, they concern Europe in no such way as do the extra-European operations of England or Russia. Excluded, too, are the dynastic upheavals and the personal rivalries for the throne most of them, to be sure, very short and decisive. Like Spain and during the same century, 1550 to 1650, Turkey fought nearly all the time. Indeed, her war figures for 1450 to 1700 afford the highest percentage of war for so long a period shown by any country. Turkey's wars were fought against the empire, and in Hungary to a large extent. Her other great foes was Spain. The victor at Lepanto in 1571 and doughty little Venice, who, though unsupported, dared meet the unspeakable Turk. What a bulwark Venice was against him. Like Poland, she sacrificed much of her own future in intercepting from Western Europe the blows of less civilized Asiatic. Since the Peace of Parasowitz, in 1718, Turkey has ceased to be a formidable foe, and her number of wars has declined decidedly. The first half of the 19th century was more warlike than the preceding because of countless risings in the Balkans and the aggressive policy of Russia. Still, the percentage does not rise to 50. The one fact that stands out most prominently in the history of Turkish wars is the abrupt falling off after the year 1700. Since 1900, Turkey has been involved in three wars, including the present one, the first against Italy and the second the Balkan War, both short but very disastrous to the Ottoman Empire. Turkey, 1450-1914 Murad II, 1421-1451 1450-1453 Murad II, 1450-1453 Greek Empire, ended by the capture of Constantinople 1450-1454 Venice 
Muhammad II, 1451 to 1481. 1451 to 1461, war with Skanderberg of Albania. 1454 to 1458, invasion of Serbia. 1454 to 1456, Hunadi. 1458 to 1462, Greek War. 1462 to 1464, Congress of Wallachia and Bosnia. 1463 to 1464, Hunadi in Hungary. 1463 to 1479, Venice. 1464 to 1467, Skanderberg. 1469 to 1480, The Empire. 1474, Repulse in Albania. 1475, Repulse in Moldovia. 1480 to 1481, Attack on Apulia. 1480, Attack on Rhodes. Bayezid II, 1481 to 1512. 1482 to 1483, Hungarian aggressions. 1486 to 1489, Poland. 1490 to 1495, Hungary. 1497, Poland. 1498 to 1503, Venice. 1499 to 1502, Hungarian War. Selim I, 1512 to 1520. 1512 to 1519, Hungary. Suleiman I, 1520 to 1566. 1521 to 1531, the Empire. 1522, Conquest of Rhodes. 1532 to 1534, the Empire. 1535, Spain and the Empire. 1536 to 1540, Venice. 1537 to 1547, the Empire. 1538 to 1547, the Pope. 1541, Spain, a June expedition of Charles V. 1551 to 1562, the Empire of Hungary, 1559 to 1564, Spain. Selim II, 1566 to 1574. 1565 to 1568, the Empire. 1569 to 1580, Spain, Campania Lepanto. 1570 to 1573, Venice and the Pope. Morad III, 1574 to 1595. 1575 to 1593, Partisan War in Hungary. 1593 to 1606, active or nominal war with the Empire in Hungary. Muhammad III, 1595 to 1603. 1596 to 1606, rising in the Balkans. Ahmed I, 1603 to 1617. 1604, Spanish expedition against Turks. 1607-1609, Interruptions of Cossacks on Black Sea. 1607-1624, Turkey, involved in the Moldavian War. 1610-1614, in Spain. 1616-1617, Sea Raids of Jean-Pierre. Osman II, 1618-1622. 1618-1619, Spain. 1618-1621, Poland. Mustafa I. 1622 to 1623. Murad IV, 1623 to 1640. 1625 to 1626, Cossack raids in Black Sea region. 1627, Cossack raids in Black Sea region. 1627 to 1645, State of War in Moldova. 1628, Cossack again in Black Sea region. Ibrahim, 1640 1648. 1645 to 1669, Venice. 1646 to 1648, Tatar and Turkish raids in Poland. Regency, 1648 to 1663. 1657 to 1662, Hungary against Rakoxi and the foes of Poland. 1661 to 1664, the Empire, Campaign of St. Gothard. Mohammed IV, 1663 to 1687. 1663 to 1664, France, the ally of the Emperor of St. Gothard. 1672, Poland. 1673 to 1675, Poland. 1666 to 1681, Russian Cossacks ended by a peace with the Tsar himself. 1682 to 1699, Austria ended by peace of Karlowitz. 1683 to 1699, the Empire ended by Peace of Karlowitz. 1683 to 1699, Poland ended by Peace of Karlowitz. 1683 to 1699, Venice ended by Peace of Karlowitz. Suleiman II, 1687 to 1691, 
Ahmed II, 1691 to 1695. 1687 to 1699, Raja. Mustafa II, 1695 to 1703. Ahmed III. 1703 to 1730. 1711 to 1712, Russia and by peace of Pruth. 1714 to 1718, Venice and by peace of Pazowitz. Mahmud I. 1730 to 1754. 1716 to 1718, Austria. 1735 to 1739, Russia and by peace of Belgrade. 1737 to 1757. Mustafa III. 1757 to 1773. 1768 to 1774, Russia and by Treaty of Kuchuk Kenarj. 1770, Revolt of Greeks. Abu Ulhamid, 1773 to 1789. 1783 to 1784, loss of the Crimea. 1787 to 1792, Russia and by Treaty of Chazi. 1787 to 1791, Austria. Selin III, 1789 to 1807. 1798 to 1801, France, Bonaparte's Syrian campaign. 1802 to 1803, revolt of the Sulits. 1804 to 1812, Serbian rebellion. 1806-1812, Russia ended by peace of Bucharest. Mustafa IV, 1807-1808. 1807, English attack on Constantinople. Mahmud II, 1808-1839. 1815, Serbian rebellion. 1816, English attack on Algiers. 1820-1822, revolt of Ali Pasha in Ipurius. 1821-1829, War of Greeks for their independence from Turkey. 1827. Interference of powers in aid of Greeks at Navarino. 1828-1829. Russia ended by peace of Adrianople. 1830. Insurrection in the Balkans. 1831-1833. Revolt of Mehmet Ali. Abu al-Majid. 1839-1861. 1839-1841. Second revolt of Mehmet Ali. 1852-1853, Montenegro. 1853-1856, Russia and by Treaty of Paris, Crimean War. 1858, Second War of Montenegro. Abu Ul-Aziz, 1861-1876. 1861-1862, Third War of Montenegro. 1862, Bombardment of Belgrade. 1866-1869, Revolt of Crete. 1875-1876, Revolt of Herzegovina. 1875-1876, Massacres in Bulgaria. Abu Ulhamid II, 1876-1909. War in Serbia and Montenegro. 1877-1878, Russia and White Peace of Berlin. 1894-1896, Armenian Massacres. 1896-1898, Revolt of Crete. 1897, Greek War, and by Treaty of Constantinople. Mohammed V, 1909. 1911, Italy. 1912, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Greece. 1914, Russia, England, France, Serbia, and Allies. End of chapter 13. Section 13 of Is War Diminishing? By Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Bolsey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Appendix Chart A The reader will observe that on Chart A, the countries are arranged so that each is next to those with which it has been most at war. In this way, we are able to see, at a glance, the Russo-Swedish War of the late 15th and early 16th centuries, the two wars of Turkey and Austria in the first half of the 16th century, and the two in the second half. The war for Dutch independence is clean-cut in the columns of Holland and Spain, while England's share in the struggle is manifest. Poland, Russia, Sweden, and Denmark exhibit the first great northern war of the second half of the 16th century, 
Glancing to the right, one sees a black pitch of the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, in which the Second Great Northern War is merged. Then the double streak of the War of the League of Augsburg in the West, and the conflict in the East, which led to the Peace of Karlowitz in 1669. After that comes the black strip that marks the War of the Spanish Succession, the Third Great Northern War, and the Turkish War that ended at Peserowitz in 1718. There was no break in the continuity of black from 1450 to 1721. During this period of 271 years, there was no year in which at least one of the eleven nations whose wars are held tabulated was not fighting. Four short spaces of time present themselves in which all of the countries were at war, when an unbroken line of black is to be seen from top to bottom of the figure. These little stretches, however, possess no significance of the Rhone indicating any particular series of events. With the Treaty of Neistat between Russia and Sweden in 1721, the Temple of Janus was closed for the first time in modern history. From this time on, constant breaks occur in the chart's column of black. After 1721, the first striking period of warfare is that of the Austrian succession, next that of the Seven Years' War, and a half-century later, the chart shows in heavy black the revolutionary and Napoleonic conflicts. From Waterloo a century ago to the summer of 1914, no war has enveloped Europe as a whole. There have been fewer and of duration so comparatively short that, on a chart such as this, they present a slight appearance. Charts B, C and D As the decrease in number of years of war being as great proportionally for what are today the great powers of Europe as has been for what are today the impotent or decadent states of Europe. As scrutiny of chart D, we have compared the average curves of the five strong powers of today and five weak nations of today, together with the average curve of all, shows that the lesser nations saw a more complete decline in war than the greater. The general proportion of the figure of chart C, that of the lesser nations, is of a slope from left to right, while that of chart B, that of the greater nations, is much more nearly horizontal. Russia has had a great decrease, so has Austria, but England, France and Russia show a far less decided downward curve. On the other hand, Turkey ceased to fight many great wars. Denmark, Sweden and Holland either ceased fighting altogether or dropped from the ranks of belligerents to all practical intents. The great powers are not the powers that have lost the military taste. The small states are the homes of peaceful policy. This may not be a sure historical generalization, but it is at least a suggestion that cannot be avoided. End of section 14 And end of Is War Diminishing by Frederick Adams Woods and Alexander Balsey Recorded by Leon Harvey